It's time for Twig This Week at Google. Jeff, Stacy, and Ant are all here. Lots of things to talk about. The podcast serial seems to have made a real impact. A new Chromebook coming, not from Google, but with Google's help. And why Getty Images won't let you use AI-generated art. It's all coming up next on Twig. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twig. This is Twig. This Week in Google, episode 682, recorded September 21st, 2022. Click the clicker. This episode of This Week in Google is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Are you looking to break into the world of IT? Get the introduction you need with IT Pro TV. Get 30% off when you sign up at itpro.tv slash twit and use the code twit30 at checkout. And by Melissa. Poor data quality can cost organizations an average of $15 million every year. Make sure your customer contact data is up to date. Get started today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. And by SecureWorks. Are you ready for inevitable cyber threats? SecureWorks detects evolving adversaries and defends against them with a combination of security analytics and threat intelligence direct from their own counter threat unit. Visit secureworks.com slash twit to get a free trial of Tagus Extended Detection and Response, also referenced as XDR. It's time for Twig This Week in Google, the show where we cover the latest news from the Google verse and everywhere else. Stacy, love to see Stacy Higginbotham in her black jumpsuit, or is it navy? <laughs> is it navy? It's black. Yeah, and you've got a little Marcel hairdo going. You look like you should oh, be yeah. working in a uh, factory in 1943 France. So <laughs> That's me. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> I bet she's in the resistance, kids. Uh, Stacy is at Stacy at IOT on IOT.com. Stacy on IOT.com. She also hosts the IOT podcast. And I have some questions for her about helium. We'll get to that in just a little bit. <sighs> <laughs> Didn't you have that helium router? I Yes, I do. I've got possible answers. Keep going. <laughs> when we were uh, in Seattle, I thought, gosh, if I were to sail by Bainbridge Island, I could use Stacy's helium. If you were on a cruise ship, you could have used my I know, helium. I I'm, know. I watched those ships go by. I know. They're within range. I was trying, but I didn't. it, it wasn't labeled like Stacy's helium or anything. So next time. No, it has a fancy name. It's like Foxtrot Adobo. I, I should have found something. out ahead of time. All right. Oh, well, next time. And there will be a next time. I like sailing by Bainbridge Island. Also with us, ladies and gentlemen, somebody Pat Sajak hates. We're going to add that. I have to write that <laughs> to write that in on the list here. I put that on the list. Mr. Jeff Jarvis, the Leonard Tao Professor for Journalistic Innovation at the Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City. University of New York. Hello, Mr. J. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Also, Anthony Pruitt is here from Hop Hands on Photography. Hello. Did you just give me the up your nose with the rubber hose salute? No. I think you did. Hey, what is that? <laughs> is that what this means? Well, all I remember is in The Darkest Hour, which is a wonderful movie with uh, uh, is it Gary Sinise as uh, Winston Churchill, whoever it is, uh, as Winston Churchill. Initially, Churchill does this as the V for victory sign with his with his oh. fist facing out, and one, and his secretary says, "Mr. Churchill, <laughs> oh, that wow. doesn't mean what you think it does." Wow. And uh, he that's why he turned it around uh, and and made it his own. Um, anyway, the two finger like salute. salute people I respect. That's all. I yeah. just salute the people I respect. I, it's fine to do what you did, like the Cub Scout salute. Just don't do this. <laughs> Just don't go Two all the way. salute is used in <laughs> Poland. All the way around. It's used okay. in Poland. Do you have like a uh, like a hand salute dictionary? You just looked that up in Jeff? Wikipedia. Oh, it's all there's there. this thing called the internet. I'm sure you by this point you probably turned it off because you're disgusted with it. I right, hate please. the internet, but I am this happy. Stuff I as, learn on Twig. Good grief. <laughs> as a framework <laughs> owner, to hear that Google. So last week we had the bad news that Google, and this was still a rumor from the Verge, but a rumor only. 
that the Google was abandoning uh, the uh, Pixel Book that had been moving quite far along with. But now news uh, from Framework that they're going to make a Chromebook in partnership with Google, Yay. the Framework Laptop Chromebook Edition. I uh, Framework I am a fan of, very much so. I have a Framework laptop that I really like. Uh, the whole proposition, the value prop of Framework, is it's completely upgradable. In fact, uh, they lived up to their promise. I have a uh, 11th gen Intel processor in mind, but I could buy the upgrade, do it yourself to a 12th gen. What does that cost? Just the 819 upgrade? bucks. Oh, 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 so you don't, don't well, you get a whole new motherboard. But the fact that you can yeah. even buy a motherboard with uh, an yeah. laptop with an upgradable motherboard is mind-boggling. You can upgrade everything in this laptop, and that's why I like them. They are right to repair times 10. And surprisingly, a very good, lightweight, very nice laptop. 2.8 pounds, the Chromebook. Yeah. So for them to offer a Chromebook, I think, is fascinating. There is, uh, Kevin Tofel wrote it up uh, and about Chromebooks.com. You brought that to my attention and said, uh, and it's true if you order it, that... Uh, they say, at this time, we have no plans for motherboard upgrades. It comes with an i5. Not cheap. It's 1000 bucks. 8 gigs of memory, 250 oh, gigs of storage, Wi-Fi 6E. You can, though, add not only external customizations, as with all framework laptops, but you can put more storage in it because it uses standard storage. You can even put more RAM in it because it uses standard RAM. But can I upgrade my CPU later on the FAQ? says, we haven't announced any plans for a newer... Chrome OS compatible main board at this time. That doesn't mean they're not going to do it, but that's something to be. It seems like it, there'd be no point in doing a framework Chromebook if you couldn't upgrade it. So this would be right. the first time you've ever been able to buy a, a, a Chromebook that you could put more horsepower on in down know, the road. Memory in, at least, yeah, yeah. Now Intel, what of does course, it say you can change be bezels. I don't get that. Yeah, that's all frameworks. The front bezel, you can get it in orange. Oh no, that's it. Oh. <gasps> <laughs> I would like it oh, in orange. Sticky. Yeah, see? Winning. See? Winning. I love orange. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very happy with my framework. I've bought a, if you go to the marketplace, I've bought a number of different like modules for it and so forth. You can also, when people complain that the hinge was a little loose, buy an upgraded hinge. You can get these little expansion cards ranging in price. I got the terabyte expansion card because uh, it's got USB-C. You can see they do have quite a few upgrades, not just for the motherboard, uh, if you go to a i5 12th gen, it's 538. The one I quoted was 12th gen i7. But you can also upgrade, you know, upgrade to the existing capacity. It uses standard. Oh, so you can do memory too. Oh, yeah, it I uses see. standard oh. memory cards. Uh, which oh, yeah. it's, it's eight, eight gigs on. Yeah, but you could put for 80 on. bucks, you could put 16 in. Yeah. So that's yeah. not bad. And they can. This and by the way, fun. you don't have to buy it from Framework. These are standard SO dims. So you can oh. same thing with M.2 uh, oh, storage. Awesome. So it's very. It's. I love this framework. I'm very, very happy with it. Do they sell t-shirts? Probably. Mr. Report. Yes. Is it Do they sell them in orange? Say... Let me find you a bezel. <laughs> we. I did say I would bet. I would bezel it. Yeah. There's the orange. Oh, they nice. Have gray, okay, black, sorry. gray, and orange. And this is magnetic, so it's actually really <gasps> easy to oh, snap oh, it on. They're so like, fun. Oh. Yeah. I'm. I'm a. Big... It is kind of a Clemson orange, not a UT yes, orange. Yes. <laughs> Boy, look at that That's all right. I'm orange. I'm down for the Clemson orange. That's the best orange <laughs> there. So ads ads ordering on the framework. Oh, and yes, they do have it. merch. I'm sorry, Aunt. You had a real question. You had a question. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Before, is it safe to say that all of the additional horsepower that's being offered up for these Chromebooks is pretty much just for the developer community? Because I thought Chrome OS was pretty efficient as an operating system. Why would it need all of this extra? horsepower for the average person to ask mr jarvis what what am i chopped liver <laughs> well but again i look, do important look, work here dr right, Pruitt. But look, i need you, the best what, what, I can you're opening get. up a text editor in what a you probably opening a, a huge all you're stretch. running ever is chrome it's a right. all I've ever is chrome but i'm 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 which I'm is playing by the videos. way videos chrome I'm is no lightweight <laughs> no, it's not right. yeah, chrome is a pretty big power in like energy or yeah. Google's Memory always hot. sold i7s uh, for its Pixel books, right? Um, we mm -hmm. have i7s. This is an i5 from Framework at 999. That's mm -hmm. certainly more than enough. Most Chromebooks, as you mentioned, yeah, have yeah. have scant RAM, and they usually have crap processors. Well, two RAM, two two of RAM is too little. 
Definitely. I, I, you, you need know, four. I've, they sell them with yeah, four. Yeah, four, four gigabit. Gigabit. And eight is ideal. Eight's like the plenty. Minimum. Yeah. Eight's plenty, I would say. Yeah. Uh, but you could put yeah. more in. And, you know, it just means you can do more ta you have more tabs open or something like that. Chrome well, is I know not people who have literally hundreds of tabs open. And uh, <laughs> you can put Linux on this. So uh, that's why Kevin loves it. Yeah. And so you can yeah, absolutely. But even with that, that's. Yeah. Uh, lean OS, lean mean. Well, lean it's not. OS, I mean, right? again, you could put Linux and run Caden and live and do, do video editing, and with it. so there's a lot of it. You you could, okay. yeah. It depends what you want. You're right. That's more developer focused than is normal person. You probably probably nobody needs a thousand dollar Chromebook, but if you want that's one, been my <clears throat> <point>. <laughs> that's been no, my I've, point. I've, all these times. Yeah, yes, I would love to have the ideal five hundred, six hundred dollar Chromebook, but I've never found it. And and by buying the high end, I get yeah. an excellent machine. I get an excellent keyboard. I get an excellent screen. I get the whole Megilla. That's what I'm buying. Is don't forget the build here as well. Right. I just think this is really uh, a, a smart move on Google's part. If they're not going to offer a high end Chromebook, go with a company that can and make it upgradable. That's pretty cool. What's unclear, and I'm sure uh, Kevin will do some research on this and we'll find out, is what it takes to make this motherboard Chrome OS certified. I, and I don't know. I think, you know, you have to have the developer switch, right, that you can put in developer mode. I don't know. Um, hmm. It doesn't mention any specific modifications. Uh, it's interesting they offer an i5, not an i7. Uh, but i5 is certainly more, more than anything. For, for a Chromebook, for I, even Chromebook. I will admit, even yeah, though yeah. Ant is going to look down his nose at me, uh, I will say yeah. that an i5 is plenty. Framework saying, offers if you spend Windows thousand dollars. Put it on a on a on a better machine. Put that towards what a better and machine. get Windows with it? No, thank you. Very I didn't much. say that. Well, I just said a better machine. You get <laughs> stuck with the Apple uh, prison? No, thank you very you much. You can put Linux. In fact, I run a Manjaro Linux on my framework. Runs great. Yeah. yeah fingerprint yeah. reader works. Trackpad works. Everything works. Cameras work. So um, it's a good choice for Windows or Linux or now. Chrome Shout OS. out to you for mentioning Caden Live, sir. Good, it's a good program, isn't it? Yeah. Use it for your video editing ever. Yeah. I, I've I've played with it over the Open years. Open source, yeah. yeah. So that's our top story, just for you, Jeff. Yes, thank you. It makes me feel better after my morning last week. I can blow out my candle. Oh, happy birthday! By the way, <laughs> happy birthday. No. Oh, okay. happy birthday. No, no. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Where did that come from? I thought it was your birthday because you had a I'm candle. I'm effing old enough as is. You're trying to make me yet older? No, oh, your stop. birthday was a while ago. That's right. Okay. Oh, never mind. <laughs> what are you doing to me? Uh, they will have, uh, I believe they will be talking about this tomorrow on Tech News Weekly with Micah and uh, Jason. A big study from Mozilla found that YouTube's dislike and not interested buttons barely do anything. Mm. You're still going to get recommended uh, Nazi porn uh, no matter what, right? Using video recommendations data from more than 20,000 YouTube users, Mozilla researchers found buttons like not interested, thumbs down, dislike, stop recommending channel, remove from watch history, are largely ineffective at preventing similar content from oh being boy. recommended. It sounds it's like just like the um, oh. crosswalk buttons. It's a placebo oh, button. Placebo yeah. buttons. <laughs> Even at their best, these buttons still allow through more than half the recommendations similar to what a user said they didn't want. At their worst, <laughs> the buttons hardly made a dent. But we don't know oh, how wow. these services are using it in their own general recommendation algorithms it may not affect you personally but it may be metadata for them at a, at a higher level some of this is like do not show this again like yeah can i it, just yeah say, that doesn't work like google really thinks that i care about leonardo dicaprio and i do not you really should all. can i just say you and really have, really should <laughs> i have told google so many times i have stopped clicking like leonardo dicaprio could invent a brand new semiconductor or like discover a whole new band of spectrum. And I would not click on that article just to avoid confusing wow. Google. All right, I'm going to go to I Casey know. Neistat's. We're moving back to New York City. I am going to say... It's two weeks in a row with Casey. Dislike. Look at Neistat making Well, tweet. you're being mean to him. Two well, no, I, I wanted to pick something that I didn't mind. Uh, what else can I do besides just thumbs down? I can say... That's all I've ever done. Can you say, don't, don't, don't recommend this anymore? Don't. Apparently, there are ways to do that. 
Unfortunately, yeah, I'm already subscribed to the emails. channel, so that would explain. <laughs> so it's, it's not going to work. Never mind. Forget I said anything. Sorry, uh, Casey. Uh, all I see is report, show transcript. No, I love Casey. I'm just. Yeah. I don't. I don't see any way to say. Let don't me, don't show me, me this some. anymore. Let's see what Google's going to try to show me on basic YouTube. I'm trying. Oh, Best, by the way. Spice lattes. Do you, do you, <laughs> of course, it's that time of year. Autumn begins tomorrow. Stacy, do you pay for YouTube premium? No. I wish Good. they would stop asking me. <laughs> I do. Good. So how many pre-roll videos do you get? I have heard from people that is as many as five to ten wow. unskippable no. ads no. Jeez. It's painful. No, I don't get that many. Maybe they just have given up um, on you. I, I no, because I get two, sometimes I get two, but it has to be like I get two if I have like a SNL clip or something that's like I think hot ones. If I if I watch hot ones, mm -hmm. sometimes I get but like I'm on a rowing workout right now. I don't have any ads. <laughs> yeah. I mean it have to be something that's monetized. Try uh you try one these of the, are monetized. Try one of the Twitch. Try hot ones. Or the hot ones would be good, or try one of the Twitch ones. Uh, I've, I mean, I've been hearing on, uh, I've been reading on Reddit and other places. It really has gone out of control. Five to ten. Un All right. Okay, count the premiums. I just, well, I just went to. Um, See, I'm on premium, so I don't wait. know. Yeah, I, but I, I went to to incognito, and you can do the same thing. I got one of two. That's not too bad. And the one is skippable. Oh, okay. I just got a one skippable. Okay. So you got up to two ads, and one of them skippable. Huh. Let me try something. I could try Twit. Uh, I don't think I've ever I watched did, Twit. Um, so apparently, you now, thank you, Scooter X, in our chat room. YouTube says it was an experiment. Yeah, I, did two. I got two. <laughs> so YouTube says it has concluded. That explains it. It has oh. a nice statement to 95 uh, Google YouTube says it has concluded this test. Over the past month or two, some YouTube viewers have noted advertisements on the platform have been expanding greatly in length and quantity, especially in unskippable formats. Uh, and they confirm the same that I saw, which is threads on Reddit show ads with as many as 10 ads in a row that can't be skipped. It isn't happening Best to man. everybody or to all videos. The good news, the ads aren't super long. A YouTube spokesman has confirmed these are expanded, quote, ad pods. That was an ad pod you were watching. Uh, was part of a small experiment that has since concluded. At YouTube, we're focused on helping brands connect with audiences around the world. And we're always testing new ways to surface ads that enhance the viewer experience. How does an ad ever enhance <laughs> the user experience? We were at a small experiment. Super Bowl. Globally, that sometimes I really need insurance products, <laughs> and boy, howdy! <laughs> we were at a small Very experiment helpful. globally that served multiple ads in an ad pod when viewers watched longer videos on connected TVs. Oh, you'd have to watch on the TV. The goal was to build a better experience for viewers by reducing ad breaks. We're gonna put them all up front, make you watch them, <laughs> and Who then you did that. <laughs> For, for some yeah. of their shows, they, yeah. they do, not all of them, but, and they asked you, you could be like, do you want to watch one long ad or like have it up? And I'd be like, Ooh, one long ad. Right. Then you go get snacks and I you just, come back. I, so here's my question. Are they cynical or stupid? Uh, the ones on YouTube are pretty <laughs> A new game stupid. show category. Cynical, <laughs> cynical or, stupid. or stupid. So the do they really think stupid. that this is about improving the viewer experience? No. They say no you, he, well, YouTube reiterates you to watch ads. that a user experience is about paying creators Mr. to be Creator. a top priority. Um, I so, mean, if you're going to give someone ads, maybe you care about how they're. I mean, it's yes, that's what they're saying. Instead of interrupting the show, we're just going to force you to watch all the ads at the beginning. Now, if I'm the creator, no. I don't like that because. No. Don't you think that drives people away? They, they go, right. Oh, well, they're not going to consume your content because they're like, well, good grief. You haven't gotten to the content yet with, right. by showing me all of these ads. They say, hey, some some viewers say that about just the intros to videos. They say the intro is too long. So if you want the oh, user it is. experience. God. 
Yeah. They're so long. Hit the button. Subscribe to that. I know. I'm like, oh. In a little bit, we're going to tell you something you wanted to know. But first, let me talk some more about oh. other stuff. Of course, we do that, too. But, <laughs> but we know you're stuck here for three hours, so it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we do ads. I, look, I'm not against ads. I'm not against ads. We uh, do give people I, I, the I, right I, to pay for no ads, as does YouTube. Yeah, but I don't kid myself that this that, that the ads are in some way a huge benefit to the user experience. Uh, I mean, that's just it's the it's the price you pay for content. You have to pay for content. Mm -hmm. so. The price you pay for free content. Yeah, yeah. I it is it would be cynical of me to say. So maybe I'm cynical, not stupid, but uh, be, um, but I just feel like that for them to to lay, lay it on. Oh, we're trying to improve your experience. I find that a little disingenuous. I wonder what what their results were when they rolled this test out to people. Like, I what, don't know if they stopped the it. Spot <laughs> as soon as you anybody know. noticed, they stopped it. And remember, well, I mean, it, he said it was just on connected TV, so it wouldn't have been on your mobile device. It was if well, you were watching YouTube on a TV, which I do a lot more and more. Yeah. Well, right now, uh, ideally, you'll see two pre-roll ads. Ideally, that's livable. Um, that's and livable. that's that's usable. So, what are I guarantee I you, what they were doing is testing. Well, how many can we get away with? Right. Like, how long they, were the ads? Were they ten now? second ads? They say they were short. I I don't know how short. That's short what is. that's what they're experimenting with. Is would be if you take the same two minutes and cram in more advertisers, will that affect people? You know. And also, let's face it, how many? How often do you see come ons for YouTube Premium, Stacy? That's their real goal, right? Like every right. time. Yeah. That's a point. Yeah, irritate right. you so much. Please, just please. For it. Speaking yeah, of irritation, I'm not in, I see that banner. I, I need to have a Jeff Jarvis moment. Oh, wait, uh -oh. wait, wait, wait! Uh -oh. You said irritation and Jeff Jarvis in the same sentence. It's Thank coming. you very yeah, much. That's right. I'm worried. I'm worried here. Well, wait a minute. Let me slide back here, and I can this join these two monitors together. <laughs> and you guys, you guys, I guess that's too much trouble. Go ahead, Jeff Jarvis moment. Here we go. Speaking of like constantly inundating you with, do you want this? Okay. The New York Times, a subscription, which I pay for, is constantly asking me, hey, this is better than the app. Wouldn't you like to download the app? And oh, I'm like, I, no. I hate that. I uh, hate yeah. that. It yeah. is. Yeah. It's yeah. constant. There are ad blockers that will prevent that. It's hard on mobile, I think. Uh, yeah, I've funny? got it. It's only on mobile that I'm doing this, but it's yeah. driving me bonkers. And I do, I feel je very Jeff. I'm like, how many times can we really annoy people, especially paying yep. customers? It's rude. I've yep. not seen it yep. yet, okay. but Mr. Micah Sargent has said something similar about Zoom. Um, he pays for the service. I pay for the service. But he says he's getting an ad every time he opens it up. And I'm like, really? what's the point? I'm <laughs> You're not. paying your $15 a month. What's the point of of an ad showing up on No, but Stacy's talking about the far more annoying thing, and I see it all the time. When you open something in a web page, it says, you know, you really should be using our app. And it takes yeah. over the top and says, you should be using the Red Hat app. You should be using the Zoom app. Right. You should be. The yeah. I find that. I agree with you, Stacy. That's that's almost as, that's probably worse than an ad. It's like, no, I don't. Yeah. Just, I'm trying to look at Because the your, only reason they want that is more data, data. Right, uh, from me. That's very the only good reason. point. That's a good reason to be mad at. Yes. Because they already got your subscription. Yeah, I'm giving you money. Stop. And you're already getting my, you know, IP data. You're getting plenty of data, New York Times. You know who I am. You know. Twitter does it Got too. my login. We got to let people Ugh. know there's a, I think this really needs, the word needs to go forth. That the most valuable thing for companies to be an app on your front page of your phone. That is just by itself hugely valuable. To the point yeah. where they don't mind annoying you endlessly to get you to do it. People just install apps willy nilly, leave them on, let them run, give them permissions. Uh, you just you're handing over tons of stuff. Uh, anyway, Mr. back to Scooter. Put the uh, tweet from Micah Sargent out about Zoom. See, I haven't seen this. Uh, he put it. I in just the went RC. to Zoom and I didn't see it. But does he see it in the see. app or does he see it on the web? It says, "Hey Zoom, I pay you every month for Zoom Pro. Why am I getting these app from you after every single? Don't Zoom alone." Invite friends to save $38. They're trying to give you money, Mike. Don't What's Zoom that? alone. <laughs> That's actually kind of like, oh, you poor thing. Yeah. Dude, Mike, are you <laughs> making calls to yourself? Is that why? Are you the only person with a fax machine in your friend group? 
<laughs> Actually, it's a good deal, though. They get 30% off their first year, and you get a $20 Amazon gift card. So, oh, my God. I'm not giving them any free money. Although, if you want to, go to Micah and refer a friend. I have never seen this Zoom. <laughs> I've never seen that either. Ad. We uh, we have a Twit account, so everybody at Twit's using. Micah, if you're using your personal Zoom account, why don't you start using our a Twit account? You can have the or same Or why don't address. we get all the viewers to, to line I'm up using, and make I'm Micah money? Personal. It's okay. Make Micah money. Micah, everybody sign up for with Micah. Oh, they also say, here's another one he gets. Bro First of all, don't Zoom alone. Then broaden your reach. For a limited oh, time, save fifty percent off your first four months of a large meeting five hundred dollar ad plan. We already know he's zooming alone. Why would you ask? That's just you hurtful. Narrow-minded, Micah. <laughs> That's Boy. just hurtful. If you only had five hundred friends, we could uh, get you a deal. <laughs> just hurt. That's just hurtful. <laughs> oh, there, there's a there's a whole bunch of them. Micah's got a, just a range of these. Connect with your audience for a limited time. Save fifty percent on your first four months. Wait, he's alone now. He has an audience. <laughs> Oh, and then he's getting the magical automatic support from Zoom. <laughs> oh, thanks for the info, Micah. Uh, are you there, Zoom? It's me, Micah. Oh, you're funny, Micah. Uh, yeah, Micah, just be used. Start. We have a few extra seats, I think, on our our Zoom account. You could That's use hilarious. use your own email and all that stuff. Do you pay for Slack, by the way? Yeah. I used to. I don't pay for that one. I just pay, pay for Zoom. You don't have to. We pay for yours. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. I can... Uh, it, it's, hey, I write it off at the end. No, but we... You, <laughs> no, 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 you don't need to... No. Are no, you slacking you with... not if, spend any money. Yeah, well, I guess he might be slacking with other companies. But they, the company no, my, you're slacking with should pay for. Oh, that's no, right. You said your family is, has a Slack. Yeah, my Slack is the family yeah. Slack. Oh. oh. Yeah, but you can... We used to have a... Giga Ohm Slack, and we all chipped in to keep our Slack going, like Aww. the former Giga Ohm reporters. Is this, we stopped after a while, yeah, but it was. It, yeah. So, uh, Aunt, do you, can you use the free tier for your family? You probably can. Huh? For Slack? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's perfectly fine. It, yeah. It's not going to keep everything, but I don't need it to keep everything. I just need it to. That's what hey, you when give I up. Tell somebody to make sure archive. to feed the dogs, they right. see it, you know? Discord's free, right? Oh, boy. There's a lot of free yeah. solutions, but it's hard to get a family to move once you got them using something, right? I uh, like Slack. I, I thought Man. about Discord, but I thought Discord would be a bit much for Maybe. this family. <laughs> you should, How old is the is oldest probably... member of your family on the Slack? Say again? How old is the oldest member of your family on the Slack? That, that would be me. And oh, so it's not like grandpa level. Okay. I see. No, no. But everybody's not Grandpa necessarily level. technically savvy. Grandpa level. In the Pruitt house. It's Grandpa level. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, the one that knows is Leo and Jeff level, yeah. Yeah, who's uh, yeah, the grandpa's I was say, here? Well... Really? Let's be, <laughs> let's be Frank. <laughs> let's be, let's be. Oh, is Frank your grandpa? Yeah. <laughs> grandpa Frank. Grandpa Frank. So, by the way, Slack. So this is an interest. We kind of were started talking about this on uh, Windows Weekly. Everybody and their brothers adding an office suite. Slack is adding an office suite. Canva is adding an office suite. Everybody oh, is uh, at, so Google's got one. Uh, there's Zoho Office, of course, Microsoft Office, and now uh, Slack wants to wants so you don't ever have to leave. What? I think this. You know what's really going on is this goes back to the. Did we talk about Figma on uh, last week? I guess it did. No, it hadn't no, happened. It just it happened. It just happened. Yeah, we talked Didn't about it on um, uh, Twit. So mm. uh, I think this is uh, this is so f so the story with Figma, Figma, which is a collaborative design tool, really cool, invented by uh, a guy who took the Peter Peter Thiel money. Yeah, remember that Peter Thiel about five six years ago said, "I don't like college. You should drop out of college." In fact. I'll give you $100,000 to drop out of college. I don't know why I'm making him sound like Colonel Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> drop he's out of college more, and get it's through a startup. Far more like this, I yeah, think. I'll give you a, 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 a. Anyway, so uh, this, uh, yeah. <laughs> I have never heard him speak. Is that ever I haven't either, but I, in my mind, he's more like a Remember in the, the very fi pilot episode of uh, Silicon Valley, there's a, I think, a Peter Thiel 
style uh, startup guy. He's driving a car that's so thin. It's, <laughs> it's a one-person one car, and he can get through. He can get through cars. Oh, man. It's I very funny. About that. Anyway, <laughs> worth watching, guys. Episode one, Silicon Valley, season one. Uh, where were we? Oh, yeah, so. It's actually it's a really Figma. great it's a really great story. This kid this kid uh, 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 grew up here in Sonoma County. His name was uh, Dylan. Um, oh, what's his name? I can't remember. Uh, Dylan Byer. Anyway, cute cute young guy. Field. Fields. Dylan Field took uh, went to could, couldn't get into Berkeley. He but he was into computers when he was three years old. lived lived up the road a piece. His parents got a computer, really got into it. In high school, he was part of the first robotics project, right? Really got into that. So he started to love technology, but his grades weren't so good. Couldn't get into Cal. Somehow he got into Brown. I don't know how he, Brown's, I think, which harder. Is a, which is even, really hard. Even know. harder. I don't know. But he couldn't get into UC Berkeley, but he got into Brown. Went to Brown for three years. Peter Thiel says, I give you $100,000 to stop going to college. So he does. His first dream... His first Couple startup work. was a drone company designed to, to spot reckless drivers so they could give him a ticket. <laughs> kind of flopped. So then uh, Dylan says, hmm, what else? Yeah, good effort. Uh, he and his, his uh, buddy decide to start a, a collaborative de design company. This is in 2012. Uh, you know, they kind of struggled along for a while. Eventually they did raise money. I think they raised... Uh, a little bit of money uh, four years ago. Wall Street uh, Journal talked about the fact that he was still uh, living uh, in the mission, buying dollar coffee on his way to work. Very Wall Street Journal kind of uh, detail. The company itself was above a uh, bar, and it got so noisy after 3 p.m. on Fridays, they all just went home early because they couldn't get any work done. So it's just a little, typical little startup. Yeah. Where, Raised uh, some money, uh, then raised a little bit more money. Finally, got up to a valuation uh, of about ten billion, which is not bad. Adobe announced this week they're going to buy Figma for twenty billion dollars, biggest deal in Adobe history, one of the biggest uh, internet deals of all time. Twenty billion dollars, a lot of money for a company that only has annual recurring revenue of four hundred million. Let's see, do the math. That means yeah. it will take about uh, 20 years. Some, no, 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 not that long. They're making a billion dollars every four years. So it'll take them 80 years <laughs> to make all the money back. <laughs> no, that's not right. But that's at that current rate. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, you have so, to assume they're going to do more. But it, more importantly, Adobe, I think, felt like their lunch was getting eaten. Adobe has a competing product, Adobe XD, that wasn't competing. And right. I think it was they were there was a threat, right? So, Adobe, which that only has mean. income of around four or five billion dollars a year, is going to give them half cash, half stock, uh, with regulatory approval. Mr. Dylan Field will join the three comma. Describe club. Figma's more. What well, let's go there. We can look at it, and you can they can describe it for themselves. The collaborative interface design tool. When this news dropped I, I i was surprised because i was like who is the competition in yeah exactly canva uh, club twit one Sketch. of our members canva. mentioned is lucid charts lucid was charts. another competitor canva by the way just announced they're going to add as i go in complete full circle the same thing slack's doing they're going to add docs you know they're going to become yeah. a office suite Basically, we're all trying to figure out how to collaborate best remotely and using the internet without just using words. And that's because we're a visual. Right. I mean, this all makes sense. You've got to make it. You've got to have everything, right? You've got to have words, video, instant feedback, um, a way to produce AI. something that looks slick. AI, <laughs> 5G, <laughs> quantum. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I, I blockchain. Think, I mean, you gotta have sense. the blockchain. Oh, blockchain. It's I not forgot. complete. It's all stored on the NFTs. blockchain. NFTs. <laughs> so Adobe stock, of course, tumbled uh, as soon as they made this announcement. But uh, the folks at Figma are pretty happy. Um, yeah, I think, and of course, some of this is COVID, right? Because suddenly we're not working at the office anymore. 
Is it just office or is it a, a, a wider sense? Of I think it's a lot of gig workers. I think gig workers really just like Figma. Okay. My and my my child actually used Figma and really? Canva. Uh, but yeah, they prefer uh, Canva over. No, they prefer Figma over Canva. They hate Canva, but everyone's kind of solidified on Canva at their school. Yeah. So I think all these companies. What do they use it for? Group projects, Stacy. Group projects. Um, they they actually laid out an entire magazine in Canva, which. Ugh. Um, <laughs> but yeah. How old it fart was, of you, my daughter? No, don't you no, know we have like, an internet? I, I, Oh, oh, I was just like, oh my gosh! Like I had some horrifying CMSs in my life, but dear lord, is, did you play with it? Is it terrible? It's it's not for magazine layout. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. it's fine. Like I've made a slideshow. It's a like a, it's like a Canva. whiteboard, maybe more or oh, it's so yeah. it's like a presentation manager more. Yeah, it's pre I, I think of it as for presentations, but you can do lots of stuff with it. I mean. My child is now using it to make Instagram posts of like inspirational quotes for a, right. A, a, I think yeah, that's actually that's my real question. That's is it not used like, for yeah. readers. Yeah, but that's the thing. Adobe already has a product um, beyond XD called Adobe Express that does a lot of the same stuff that Canva is doing, um, and it's pretty good. It's well, that's the problem. Pretty good. The XD, on the other hand, I, I believe that's that's where they were falling apart and getting their lunch eaten yeah. in my opinion yeah well look at that i, I just made a diagram <laughs> <laughs> it was just that easy let's see uh but let's change it to the twig diagram and they give you fonts and everything this is canva Ooh, do the stacy and mm -hmm. jeff overlap yeah let's irritation stacy <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> jeff I would like Jeff to have on his side moral panic. My size should be nuance, and we should talk about this. And then yeah, the middle, the irritated bingo. Over you ass. got it, Stacy. Very self-aware. <laughs> Chickenhead twenty-one in the chat says Adobe is like Autodesk. They buy up all of their competition. There, yeah, or like Facebook. And what is what is Jeff's moral, moral panic. panic? You had to ask. <laughs> and in the what's the overlap? Irritated about ads. You, Leo. I don't know. You. You. Yeah, Leo in the middle. There you go. That's it. I have made the twig <laughs> diagram. Here we go. Wait a minute. Where's Ant? We got to add Ant. I don't know how well, to. It's your diagram. I don't know how to. <laughs> Ant can be off watching. in the side looking at all of us shaking another, his I need another, I need another circle. Yeah. Another, another <laughs> circle. And then, uh, okay, you're also irritated about me, so... <laughs> well then ant's circle should also be big <laughs> <laughs> make him bigger uh, no, anyway really you get the idea this is pretty it's pretty no. cool yeah it's yeah. nice yeah um and then oh yeah wait a minute this here we go now we got it <laughs> look at that <laughs> All of our, <laughs> all of our twit uh, graphic design uh, listeners are just who needs right who now. needs designers. <laughs> now all we need is to get our our stock art from Dolly, and then poof, we just well you won't we be getting it forever. on no, Getty no, no. on Getty, no. No. right? Page two, Getty has decided <laughs> to prohibit all AI generated content. And why, you might ask, because they don't, it's unclear who owns the rights to that content. Remember, Stable Diffusion, uh, Dolly 2, uh, and the Meta, what is it, Meta Diffusion? Mid Journey. Mid Journey are all based on scraping art. The The latter two, I don't know about Dolly, Good Dolly, I think probably not, but certainly Stable Diffusion and Mid Journey, scraping kind of public domain stuff. Uh, stuff on pinboard. So there's going to be some question when you generate some art. Like, well, who really owns that uh, that picture? Mm -hmm. So Getty says it's not it's not worth it. The presence of copyrighted imagery in the training data of AI art generators is obvious from their tendency to reproduce the Getty images watermark. Here's, here's an example from Alexica's wow. search of Donald Trump behind bars. But look. Getty Images is clearly visible. There's the Getty watermark. So Getty, wow. I think rightly so, says, yeah. Uh, 
A little dicey. A little dicey. Maybe draw it yourself. <laughs> you can build it in Canva, y'all. Or, sorry, uh, Figma. <laughs> Well, that's a good question. Do you own the rights to all the little doohickeys that you get from those design tools? Can you only do it for non-commercial? I, I bet you have to buy if you if you if you use it commercially, you got to buy it, right? Yeah, some somebody's got to get paid yeah. for commercial purposes. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, you. I mean, we pay for you. You pay for Figma and stuff based on I think isn't it access to certain tools. Oh right! Like you, you, you like you pay for the, these super editor yeah, you, tools, if you will. Exactly. I was like, okay. you can't access gifts if you don't pay five dollars a month or whatever. So I, I don't know the actual rules. Uh, Your Venn diagrams can only have three circles. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Notice there was no Leo on there except for the you know the universal hate. So. <laughs> Irritation, Leo. Irritation. No so I was going to say what we have <laughs> no in common is we love Leo, but you, with your poor self-image. Oh. I yeah, I said it irritation into, over ads. I turn it into hate. Yeah. Well, I'm going to irritate you a little bit more because it's time to talk about one of our sponsors. This week yeah. Google continues with Aunt Pruitt, Jeff Jarvis, Stacey Ooh. Higginbotham. And a visit from IT Pro TV. These are the folks who uh, Lisa and I went out to see in Gainesville a few years ago to visit their beautiful new studios. The best possible place to get your IT training, whether you want to get your first job in IT or accelerate your career in IT. IT Pro TV is not dry, dull classroom activities, not boring books. It's learning from experts in the field who are so passionate. So knowledgeable, they get you excited about what you're learning. They call them edutainers because they're fun. They make le learning engaging and fun. And with IT Pro TV, you're doing it on your own schedule, in your own way. More than 5,800 hours of up-to-date IT training. That's why they've got those studios running Monday through Friday. Seven studios running Monday through Friday, creating new content all the time because the tests change, the questions change, the software changes, the certs change, and so they need to keep up. And that's nice because it's super fresh, always up to date with the most current content. The episodes are 20 to 30 minutes long, which means you can watch them whenever it's convenient for you. And you can watch them wherever it's convenient for you on your desktop, your tablet, your mobile device. They support Apple TV. They've got a Roku app too. So it is so easy to learn, so much fun to learn, that before you know it, you will have the skills to get that cert, to get that job. It's just a great idea for IT training. If you get, it, it's like watching, you know, Twit, only you're, you're watching IT training the whole time. One reviewer says it's easy to understand what they're saying. It's well explained. The classes are very smooth along with the notes and transcriptions given. That's right. Every class has a transcription so you can read along. Great for studying, right? They give you study notes too. By wrapping the instructors, by wrapping their own experience in with the course, make it easier to comprehend the hardest topics, this reviewer says. They also make sure you feel confident enough to pass the exams. One way they do that is with practice tests. So you can take the test before you take the test. No that you're ready, you know, or not ready, and keep studying. They also have virtual labs. You don't have to have a Windows server or Windows clients to learn how to run a Windows network, for example. You can do it all in your HTML5 browser, which makes it really easy. Another reviewer says, IT Pro TV is the best website to study IT and cybersecurity-related courses. I like the part where they make a few courses free for a weekend. Every month they do that. Every month, they offer multiple free webinars you can watch, you can join into, you can ask questions. And, of course, since there are a whole bunch of them now that you, you haven't seen, you can see them all on demand. In fact, there's a few of them right there uh, on the website. Now, IT Pro TV is great for individuals, but if you're a company with an IT team, they're great for that, too. Check out IT Pro TV's business plan. They have some great deals and really great training your team will love. Get 30% off when you sign up at itpro.tv slash twit. Use the offer code twit30. 30% off when you sign up at itpro.tv slash twit and use the offer code twit30, itpro.tv. Build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. Thank you, itpro.tv, for supporting this week in Google. And 
Thank you, uh, dear listener, for using that address and that offer code. That way they'll know you saw it here. ITPro.tv slash twit. And the offer code TWIT30 for 30% off. Tomorrow night, game two, Thursday night football. Ant? Yes. What do you think? It was on, uh, <laughs> it was for the first time ever, you couldn't watch it on TV. You had to watch it on Amazon Prime. Amazon says it drew a, a, a record number of prime signups for a three hour period. Yeah. yeah, of course. <laughs> I'll sign of up. Course. Yeah, just I, to see you now. I, they and, paid and a they billion a dollars job. a year for this, right? They, they did a good job. I mean, they've already had uh, football, NFL football on before. And they did but it was always on it. CBS at the same time, right? So, so or this NFL is for blackout rules. So it's like the whole rules, are, like if you have to pay to get it any. I, I have a lot of questions about this. So let me explain the, how the arcane blackout rules work. Right? Okay. <laughs> um, you can only watch a, in, a market in game. Like, so I can watch the Niners games. So if the Niners game is on a Thursday night football, I will be able to watch it on broadcast. Yep. But last week it wasn't, a, it was, a, what was it? A Lions game. It, it would have been local in Detroit, but not anywhere else in the country. So that's where you had to watch it on Amazon prime. It's the same thing as Monday night football, which is mm -hmm. still on TV networks. You you can watch you can watch it everywhere. The only the blackout only applies if they don't sell out all the tickets. I think that yep. maybe that's even old school. I don't know what they do. That, that's so old school. I, they all sold I'm out. I'm so confused. So when can I watch these games on my local? So can I watch my local games on my yes. local? Yes, when the Seahawks television? play. Correct. When the Seahawks if and this is only Thursday night. There's still Sunday and Monday. Right. But Thursday night football. If the Seahawks are on Thursday night football, you'll be able to watch it on broadcast. The rest of the country has to use Amazon Prime to get it. And that's what I thought was very bold. I mean, what, I mean, people, do you have Amazon Prime, Ant? I do. I can't, does and, everybody and I, have it? Is that why? That's the thing. It seems to be more common than we would, would think. Uh, well, because they have way more than just television. So Right. I'd be pissed, though, if I were, you know, wanted to watch the game and I'm turning around on the dial and it's not on... The networks and you have to. I have to sign up for Amazon what? Prime. So, so well, Amazon has one hundred and forty-eight point six million Amazon okay. Prime so subscribers. Probably enough penetration. Although and streaming, uh, streaming has now beat both cable and broadcast in it in, in, in viewing. Now. Okay, so it's it, right. so okay. Thursday You're just was so old fart. What do you, even that's that that even doing that, Leo. The clicker is an old I got a fart clicker. thing. I got a yeah. clicker. <laughs> yeah, don't click the clicker. <laughs> You have the TV guide on the on the couch <laughs> yeah, around there. Yeah, you have the Honey. yellow markers in it to know what you want yeah, to watch. Yeah, the game's yeah. going to be on. So yeah. in Ca it was the Kansas City Chiefs and the Chargers. So if you were in LA or Kansas City, you'd watch it on broadcast. Scooter X says he was able to watch it on TV. Um, if you're in the appropriate broadcast area, so right. 15 As games, be. billion dollars a game, apparently a success according to Jay Marine, global head of Amazon Sport Division. Uh, because so well, many like, people what the hell else is it going to say? Well, I know. <laughs> this is an internal memo. He can no, say, it could have been a box guys similar oh, okay. to what happened with DirecTV over the last two weekends. Um, but no, they did a good job. They've always done a good job with covering football. Well, they got Al um, Michaels even, and Kirk Kirby Street. Even down Street, to having Kirby. Kirk Herb Street. Kirk Herb Street. <laughs> Kirk Herb Street. He Herbie did an Kirk amazing Street. job yeah. with yeah, all no. of his work that he has to do for college football. It was good play he by came play. came in and was just as prepared for yeah. the NFL side of things. Yeah. It was great. No, and My then, only beef is, uh, remember I was trying to switch back to Hulu Live versus YouTube TV and yeah. I decided to go with YouTube TV. It's not on is it on? Well, YouTube TV gets a leg up, in my opinion, because they offer uh, live stats while you're watching the game. Uh, you can literally just pull them up and see. Well, Fox, I mean, uh, Amazon says they're going to do that too, right? They're going to have so. x-ray. They say they're going to have x-ray. So x-ray. I hope so. You got all of that the analytics. They do ads right. <laughs> for Amazon and the other games talking about here. We're going to break down this play using the Amazon blah, 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 whatever it's called. It, it would be nice to have those additional stats yeah. in the game. Uh, the, Nielsen has not yet released the ratings, but Jay Marine in the memo said they're going to be good. That's when <laughs> that'll be the test, right? Define good. I wonder. I wonder what it'll be like versus broadcast. 
Yeah, I just uh, yeah, I guess it's, are just so, so it's a sign of the time. I, That's all. It's just well, it is. Change, so yeah. he says Leo, the, the ratings show Amazon's measurement shows that the audience numbers exceeded all of our expectations for viewership. Again, well, that's what, what Amazon that always says. Yeah, yeah. What does that mean? So, Leo, I got a, I got a physical letter, like like old the, the, the mailman for the first time in six months came and put something in our mailbox, and it was from Amazon. Oh God, was it full of anthrax? <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I I opened this strange thing from the past. It was a physical letter from Amazon saying, "We noticed you haven't used your wonderful Prime Video uh, features lately, Mr. Jarvis." You might want to recognize all the wonderful things on Prime so Video. So you pay for Prime Video, but you have never turned it on. I pay for Prime. Or well, Prime Video is included. And they're in saying the to me, hey, schmuck, don't forget, you want to stay. I it must be a heavy retention tool, I guess. Uh, absolutely. Because they keep raising the rates for Amazon Prime. What, it's 125 right. bucks now a year or something like that? Uh, and something it used like to be that. just second day postage. I think that price... It wouldn't be worth it, but if you get all this other cool stuff, maybe. Uh, Lord of the Rings, totally which they spent you. half a billion dollars. Uh, One of my friends, declared, they, I was like, hey, have you watched it? He's like, I got so sick of the finest acting that Canada can provide. <laughs> 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 it's like, oh, why whoa. does every town look like Vancouver? Oh, uh, uh, I actually... I have mixed feelings about it. It's anyway, 25 million people watched the first day. That's a good, I think that's a good number for streaming. It's not a great number for broadcast though. I mean, in its heyday, is it? Seinfeld used to get 40 million in their heyday, right? I don't know. But that was I'm not TV that guides, Jeff Jarvis. So I just was doing some research on this. Now I got to freaking find it. Um, on these numbers, because the numbers are, are, are so far down. Uh, give me a minute here, and I'll, I'll find it. Put it dry. In the days when you had three networks. And, we were, we were uh, imprisoned. Yeah, and you didn't, you know, there you had to watch what was on, pretty much. Yep. It, it wasn't unheard of, I think, for those shows to have 40 or 50 million uh, viewers back when the United States was only, you know, 200, 250 million people. So. Back when cable wasn't as prominent or internet wasn't as prominent yeah. as it is now. Season five, which was the prime time of Seinfeld, had a rating of 19.6. That means 19.6 of the available percent of the available households were watching. So that's, I mean, I'll, so it, that's, you're never going to see that in streaming ever again, I don't think. Oh, well, I think, well, also, I think there's there has to be a different. A uh, way to measure too with the binge culture nowadays. Um, well, it would be this, this, yeah, because like, what was it? Neil Gaiman was tweeting a lot about like how to get people to how to get Netflix to re up for uh, the Sandman's second season, and it wasn't enough. He said for like everybody to watch it for to be number one for however amount of time it was. Is like, you know, you've got to watch it again. You've got to make sure like it keeps growing. You can't like, so it, it was kind of interesting to, to see kind of behind the scenes on how they rate things and think about redoing things. Or, mm -hmm. uh, so Leo, I have the numbers for you. Yes. What was the number that you, you quoted? 25 million on day one. Of, of which, of. Not football of the. Uh, uh, no, that Lord of the, the Rings. The Lord of the Lord Rings. Rings. Okay. So here's football yet. Okay. And that's global, Brand by the variety, way, not U.S. Variety. Um, the four major broadcast networks averaged around 20 million viewers in total across oh. eight to 10 prime time or same day viewing. But that's average. This has fallen. This has fallen by 10 million vu viewers since 2015, says Variety. Oh, so 25 is then very good. Is yeah. been very good. <laughs> uh, mass ain't mass no more, mate. Ryan Seacrest. Rockin', rockin', like Ryan Seacrest, no. Rockin' Eve, 19.6 million viewers uh, last New Year's Eve. Well, that's because you have to watch it when it's on. Because, like, yeah. we talk about it, like, but one of the issues is if you have, if you don't have to watch something when it's on, you basically, you have infinite opportunities, so you may not watch it ever in some ways uh -huh. or, you know. I think we TV also do more. 
We, well, that's yes, yes. Well, we also so pay TV subscriptions have also fallen by ten point two million cable cutters. Uh, competition for time is getting stronger, says Variety, among not just streaming services but also video games and social media people. So yeah, uh, I mean, like tonight, instead of watching prime time, I'm going to be hanging out with my friends doing a gin tasting. <gasps> Way better. Wow, you know what would yeah. be good? I know. Would win. Combine that with <laughs> Seinfeld because you'll be a little tipsy. I find Seinfeld really annoying. Yeah, the Ram. You would. <laughs> you would. <I> know. <laughs> How do you feel about I'm Moonlighting, just, starring the fabulous? Uh, <laughs> uh, what's former his name? television critic? Former television critic Jeff something or other. So I wasn't <laughs> old enough to watch Moonlighting. Oh God, Moonlighting oh, was geez. good. Moonlighting I, I'm was sure good. it was. Yeah. I just. Will Did you have they a crush on Sybil Shepherd? Yeah, of course. Who doesn't? Oh, Natch. Where's Jammer B with the memory sound effect? Right now? <laughs> 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 so here's there's good news and bad news in the stock market. As you know, it's been not great, especially for tech right. stocks of late. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, what did they say? He lost seventy one billion dollars in net yep. worth this year. <laughs> yeah. Wow. 71 billion. <laughs> Meta's market value down by more than 60% since the spring. But <laughs> during a hearing Monday on the future of a lawsuit brought against Meta by a group of states, Aaron Panner, the attorney representing Facebook, said sometimes facts that are good for an antitrust defense are bad for business. <laughs> In other words, we're not, a, we're not a monopoly anymore. Go, you know, pound sand. Kick somebody else who's down. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a silver lining to losing $71 billion. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission, you can just... It does kind of stick a pin in antitrust legislation. Yeah. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, each worth more than a trillion. In Apple's case, almost double that. Meta, worth half a trillion, $500 billion. Well, here's here's the other thing. I wrote a post about the um, newspaper antitrust thing, allowing them to negotiate with the platforms, and it was aimed. It was the legislation was written by companies that serve this many people, this much market cap. So, news publishers will be able to negotiate with Google and Amazon and Microsoft and Apple, but now Facebook, the one they all hated, is too small to fit under the the description. I'm not, I can't say I'm sad. <laughs> no. They're still worth half a trillion dollars. I mean, it's not like, you know. Yeah. But more employees is there. I, Mark's not going to have to hunt his right. own meat or anything. I mean, he might hunt mood. his own meat. <laughs> he used to. Uh, I was waiting for this Mike Masnick piece. It came out last Friday. Uh, you remember the Texas social media bill? which essentially said platforms should not be able to kick anybody off. They shouldn't be able to, they shouldn't be allowed to, to, they shouldn't be allowed to moderate that content for political reasons. Uh, of course, uh, it was immediately challenged by internet service providers and others, NetChoice, which is a trade group and CCIA, uh, immediately challenged it. And the, and the, the, the lower court said, yeah, you know, HB 20 is unconstitutional. You can't, the government shall pass no law abridging the freedom of speech, including the freedom of a company to moderate its site. Uh, the judge tossed out the entire law as unconstitutional. Uh, Mike Masnick wrote, he wrote uh, a thoughtful, thorough ruling that explained why every bit of the law violated the website's First Amendment rights to put in place their own editorial policies. Okay, so then the state of Texas appealed to the Fifth Circuit, which said, oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, they, that's not true. And they reinstated the law, First Amendment, Schmerst Amendment, promised a ruling at some future date. And now, of course, uh, this, the Net Choice and CCIA have gone to the Supreme Court. Um, Hell yeah. Florida's law was found unconstitutional by the 11th circuit so florida is also going to the supreme court so 
It's all so it's all going to come to the Supreme Court at some point. I don't it'll be Jeff, will it be multiple cases or a single case? I don't know how that I don't know how that'll work. I think it's because right it's, now in one circuit versus another, things are enforceable in different ways. Yeah. So if you want if you want to go be mean, go be mean in Florida, but not, or no, go be mean in Texas. In Texas and yeah. it'll have to stay up. Right. Uh Obviously, for for people who are reading it in Texas, or just if you post it in Texas, or as if if your site hosts it in Texas. Oh, Stacy, you you want to like have laws that you can actually read and follow? Oh, how silly! Well, of you. by the way, uh, this hey, is another law silly, that Stacey. Facebook might have just skated under the under the the line because you have to think have uh, fifty million in revenue. I can't remember what the rule is, but Facebook yeah. is is somewhat below that. <laughs> threshold <laughs> it's a strategy leo it's all a secret it's strategy all, he's playing Zuckerberg did all chess. of this yes. to get out of this regulation it's yeah. very clever of him i think uh, smart clearly we want social networks irc channels forums to be able to moderate to have rules to say this shall not pass we don't want this kind of speech i understand that for some people if there's if it's politically motivated then they go well. I should have the right to say it. Uh, you know, in our uh, in our forums, the Twit forums, uh, we for a long time we had a couple of people that kept coming in and saying you know things that I deemed to be untrue about COVID nineteen. So I would kick them out, uh, or I would actually I, I don't think we kicked anybody out. I think we just deleted the thread or or locked the thread down. You want to say you locked it? If yeah, I remember yeah, right. you were in. You locked the thread. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of that's Paul Holder, uh, who spends a lot of time moderating it. Thank you, Paul. Um, but I agreed with him. It was the right thing uh, to do. We have the right to do that. We should have the right to do that. Absolutely. Uh, in Texas, we would not. So, the prob of course, the good news is we don't make $50 million a year. So, uh, we don't, we don't, you know, we get, we can, the small ones can skate by. It's really aimed at Twitter and Facebook, frankly. And Facebook may even skate by on. Uh, it's on incredibly stupid, incredibly dangerous. Yeah. Uh, I, I worry so much about speech. Um, you know, and I was thinking about this the other day. If you were, if you were, I was going to say we don't burn books in this country, but we are. That'll, that'll come soon. We, you know, people are banning them and so on. They're already banning them. A, might as well call it burning. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, My fear is that nobody cares. You know, we talk about it. Mike Masnick obviously has an ulcer over it. <laughs> but I don't have you. I've never seen this in the newspaper or nope. on the TV or you the know. newspaper should be standing up of all places should be standing up I for agree. speech and doing yeah. this. And they and they're not. Yes, you're right. Because because they're because of the tech lash, because, oh, the Internet is has cooties and we're going to be against the Internet as opposed to saying, see the trees for the forest, see the, the millions and billions of people on the Internet, hear their speech, understand. But. Those are the people mass media always ignored and never put in their pages and didn't respect. Uh, you know, my, my see the, the the basic theory about the internet is it brought out all these bad, ugly people. My theory is the opposite of this. The internet enabled people who were never heard in mass media to be heard, and then it's the old bad, ugly people who used to control speech who are now launching their counter reformation, and that's what we saw on January sixth, and that's what we see in all this. And it's, it's a reaction to the, the speech on the internet not previously heard. I don't think that's true. I think it's done both. I think it gives I, people I who say, haven't had a voice a voice. <laughs> but it definitely has given a voice to a lot of creepy oh, crawlies. I, of course it does. Of course it does. It does that as well. But I'm saying that the, 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 the internet didn't create that. That the, the reaction was, it's reformation, counter-reformation. And we have a lot of Martin Luthers out there today who are saying things that, that, that people could control before, and now that they can't be controlled, the old white male forces in the country are going overboard to say, I'm going to burn everything down rather than share it. Mm, I mean, I think that's some of it, but I think basically you just opened up, like you had a public square, but everybody who's in the public square knew how to dress. And then everyone's like, you know what? We don't need everybody to like know how to dress to come into the public space. We, we don't need a dress code. And then you got people who couldn't afford the dress code, which was great, right? But who wanted to play by rules. But you also got people who were like, yeah, screw the dress code. Stacy's fashion analysis of the First Amendment. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I'm trying lazy. to get people to care about it. Maybe people who care. I don't want the people who care about dress codes to care. Let's about not this. forget that the people who set 
these standards that were called civility or objectivity uh, or civility were the old white Some of them, people. yes. Some of Most them, yes. Like, I can't, like, I will not, I mean, there are lots of people who still ask me why I'm so angry when I'm truly not. Um, but it's because I'm a woman who is speaking my mind. But I will also oh, that say. must not. Love it when that, that happens. We got to spoof. <laughs> That you can't stop happen. that in its tracks. <laughs> so, so in some ways you're right, but there are still like, I, I think both are true, Jeff. Let me, let of, me of course, say. of course, always the case. But I think what's happening is that when you ask why aren't newspapers standing up for freedom of expression, the trope that they follow is the internet is bad and what we hear on the internet is bad rather than seeing that we need to defend the internet because it allows voices who've always been there, but just weren't heard. Well, why weren't they heard? Because mass media didn't include them. So it's part of the guilt of mass media as well. I'm, so, I'm ashamed so of our field. One of the, uh, I think the reason that you don't see a lot of this in mainstream mass media is because it's so hard to cover. It's so complicated. Yeah. We're even having and a And someone's time. always going to, someone's always going to come out after you and say like really crappy things. Yeah. There's gonna be a lot of truthiness, uh, going on and um it's very Heck, easy I thought to, it just wasn't sexy enough because that's that's what sells it's, yeah yeah what Actually, doesn't it's sell incredibly is stuff that's sexy. hard to explain that's really people, what's hard people will buy into it if you are the aggrieved party i mean uh, what is it grievances they sell um yeah so the so, texas attorney general our great friend ken paxton Said big text. the attorney general. I thought he was the lieutenant governor. Oh, he's AG now. Oh. Big text reign of endless censorship and their suppression of conservative viewpoints is coming to an end. Oh. These massive corporate entities cannot continue to go unchecked as they silence the voice of millions of Americans. Wow, that West their Texas aim is accent, man. <laughs> nice work. Yeah. Well, you got it. You got it. Uh, but the, so, and one of the ways that they're kind of trying to make this okay is saying well they're a common carrier they're like yeah. the phone company the phone company's not allowed to censor the what you say the phone company doesn't call. even want to be a common carrier <laughs> i know well and of course the irony is the fcc was able to overturn net neutrality by saying they're not common carriers so exactly it's, very, it's 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 uh situational uh ethics but um, their, their aim is to be as shocking as possible and to allow and and to not be the is to not have that shocking content uh pulled down because they want, they want a shot. According to the uh, Post, the all of the money. appeals court justices, both in the, the 5th and the uh, 11th in Florida and uh, Texas, have noted the difficulty of applying Supreme Court precedents. Um, we're in a new arena, wrote uh, the judge Leslie Southwick on the 5th, who dissented from Friday's decision, by the way. Uh, we're in a new arena, a very extensive one for speakers and for those who would moderate this speech. None of the precedents fit seamlessly. The closest match I see is case law establishing the right of newspapers to control what they do and do not print. And that's the law that guides me. That's why I'm not sure if it's a he or she the, that the judge dissented. Uh, he, he or she said, no, 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 this we, we got to wait till the Supreme Court gives us more guidance on this. Uh, but then, of course, the people who appro approve of the Florida and uh, Texas laws are the ones who are saying, well, no, they're common carriers. They should not. But, I, you know, it doesn't take a lot of thinking to say, OK, let's say they are common carriers that Twitter and Facebook can in no way weigh in on the content. Everything goes on their sites. They don't want this. I don't think you want this. Nobody who uses it wants it because suddenly it becomes an instant cesspool. No, that's what they want because that 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 they want to be outrageous. They want to cause January 6th. They want to say that 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 liberals are pedophiles in pizza parlors. That's the and, and what do they get out of it? They get votes on their so-called base. They get money. Look how much Trump raises from all his truth social stuff. They get um but they, they get don't to, they want get the, to keep power. But you're but gonna create a useless platform. To, right. Yeah, they you're don't care. A useless platform, but don't they also not want like you could also have the truth there though? You can also have like Yeah, but look at truth showing that look at truth social, smart. Trump's platform. It's failing because nobody really wants to hang out there. Uh well, for, because the the libs aren't there to be irritated. 
Oh, maybe that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the libs won't be, I can guarantee you, the libs won't be on uh, on Twitter if it's completely unmoderated. Nobody know, but, would yeah. be they want to destroy a, education. Nobody would be they in our chat destroy. room. No one would be in our chat room if it were completely unmoderated. Exactly. No one exactly. would use our yeah. forums if they were completely unmoderated. Unmoderated. Yeah. So then, then it has nothing to do with right or left. Civility and truth and education won't have a voice. Hallelujah, they say. We'll chase them well, all they'll away. They'll have a voice. They just the have a voice away. elsewhere. You'll just find them in other places. I mean, we've seen like nobody wants to be on Facebook anymore. Everybody's going over to other. So you'll find other places. Ah, but and, the law says it's, it's the height of absurdity. It's the height of absurdity to say that the president of the United States has been deplatformed. What are you talking about? <laughs> the guy's got a bully pulpit uh, to say that a senator is deplatformed. So, it could okay, make so journalism more valuable, or the role of a journalist more. Well, I just think uh, it kills social media. Justice Alito, yeah. who will be weighing in on this on the Supreme Court, says social oh, media platforms have transformed the way people communicate with each other and obtain news. At issue is a groundbreaking Texas law that addresses the power of dominant social media corporations to shape public discussion of the important issues of the day. That's not untrue, uh, well, just as a newspaper does. And shaping. there are there are they're conservative newspapers and there are liberal newspapers, and certainly editorial uh, slant can make one one way or the other, right? But, I don't think that's no, not true. Pull back on that on that shape. The government idea. is it, not allowed to come into the newspaper and say no, you have to slant it one way or the other. Exactly. That's up to the editorial board of the newspaper. Uh, is is the is is the premise here that there's so few social networks that they can't be allowed to be run independently? Well, here's the thing, Leo. So uh, I was reading, you're going to roll your eyes. I was reading a German newspaper about Jürgen Habermas's new book. Ooh, the excitement. Um, and, you know, his argument is, according to the this, this story I tried to read, that, yes, we used to have this many media players, now we have this many technology players. But what that misses, once again, it doesn't see the, the trees for the forest. It doesn't see that there are three billion voices who weren't there before. And if you don't look at it in the corporate, you look at it in the total voices, it's a, a hugely more diverse world of speech. But that's not how it's being analyzed in those cases is, oh my God, we only have so many platforms and they're controlling. Well, okay, let's talk about how they're controlling. They may be seeking attention, just like old media, but they're, they're scared to death of making political judgments. They're not pushing an agenda, but the right has to say, no, 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 everybody's against us and the platforms are too and they're taking down, the left says take down hate speech and then the right says, that was my hate speech you took down, how dare you? Is, my question is, is there a difference between Twitter, let's say this show, uh, if the government said, oh, you have to have this person on or that person on or you can't decide, if somebody says they want to be on Twig, they sh you can't say no to that, they should be forced to be alone. They're not going to, they're not, they're, clearly they believe that traditional media, and I guess this is closer to traditional media than social media they w the government's not allowed to do that they can't say no they i wouldn't say that leo they're gonna there there are in some states they're now going after the bookstores barnes and noble saying you got to carry certain books or you can't carry certain books that's so against the first amendment but they're but they're proposing laws to do that they're going to libraries and say you can't have any book that's nice to gay people right we're, we're, the, the, the the constitution's being thrown the irony is that it's being thrown away by the supposed constructionists right um, okay. So it's not the contention that there's something special about social. Well, I mean, I think that that's no. what Alito is saying. There's something different about social media. Our existing that's what they'll press, try to argue, but they're doing existing, it across the board. Yeah. As, as, as Ant just said, ban a book, burn a book. There's not a lot of difference. Right. Nope. Uh, all right. Let's take a little break. Uh, a theory about why spam filtering on Gmail has stopped working so well. Coming up next, Stacey Higginbotham's here. Stacey on IOT.com. I, is it, is it a, is, oh, never mind. <laughs> no, no, never mind. I, 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 uh, I retract. Is it a jumpsuit question? Yes. I, I can answer the jumpsuit question. I retract question. the jumpsuit question. Uh, <laughs> unless, <laughs> if you, if you choose to bring it up, I can't stop you, but I, I will, I will not say anything. Uh, also, Jeff Jarvis, who is wearing a lovely black turtleneck sweater. Uh, mock turtleneck, not even a real it's, turtleneck. It's Uniqlo large. Uniqlo thing. large. And I like that. That's that's my rap name. And uh, <laughs> MC Uniqlo large to you. And Mr. Hant Pruitt of Hands On 
photography. Uh, I have no questions for you, Amp. <laughs> None at all. <laughs> None. None at all. Good. Uh, yes, I thought so. Our show today yes, brought to no. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Our show today. Uh, it reminds me of the TikTok video where the guy's training his uh, roommate not to be racist, and he has a little squirt bottle. And every every time he starts to say something racist, he squirts him like a cat. Maybe that's what we should get you, Stacy. Just a little squirt bottle. Just a little. It's the punch Leo button. I can't believe I I've been on the show Leo for like button. five or six it's years it's now, hard. and it's I still don't have it. Where's Mr. Burke? It's a technically difficult. <laughs> it is. It's a challenging conundrum. Thing. Well, we don't want. See, the problem is latency. We don't want. We want the punch to actually hit right at the right time. Otherwise. The cat doesn't know what you're punishing him. For. Right. It's like clicker training. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> click, click. I might get the wrong message at a given time. Our show today brought to you by Melissa, the leading provider of global data quality and address management solutions. Did you know poor data quality can cost organizations an average of $15 million a year? Yikes. If you're a small to medium-sized business, we know you need every last cent. The longer poor quality data stays in your system, the more losses you can accumulate. Melissa will never cost you more than you're going to save. To ensure your business is successful, your customer information has got to be accurate. High quality data saves you money. There's another side to inaccurate data. Customer service. If you address someone with the wrong name or verify the wrong address when dealing with an already frustrated customer, things can go from bad to worse. Check out Melissa's cloud-based data cleansing and enrichment tool. So easy to use. Step one, upload your file, Excel, CSV. Works great. You put that in the first tab, copy and paste your data, uh, if it's CSV, into the second tab. Then select a data quality service, click next, map the input fields, select output fields, and data to append process your list. Bob's your uncle, you're done. Melissa's data quality suite will help eliminate clutter and duplicates, reducing postage and mailing costs. She also gets batch address cleansing, which processes an entire list for accuracy and completeness. Name verification, so you can parse and standardize first and last names for personalization. Profiling, which lets you analyze your data to improve its quality over time. And email verification, which removes up to 95% of bad email addresses from your database. And Melissa's flexible deployment options offer different platforms to suit any preference, business size, or budget. Melissa also has their new Lookups app on iOS or Android to search addresses, verify social security numbers, access detailed property data, and more at your fingertips. Melissa continually undergoes independent security audits to reinforce its commitment to data security, privacy, and compliance requirements. They're SOC 2, HIPAA, and GDPR compliant. Melissa's data quality suite and clean suite speaks for itself. It was, once again, I have to say, named a leader by G2. Not a surprise. Melissa's experienced, independent, and has 37 years of data quality expertise, which explains why more than 10,000 businesses know them as the address experts. And if you sign up for a service level agreement, you'll get 24-7 world-renowned support from their global support center. So make sure your customer contact data is up to date. Get started today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. Melissa.com slash twit, M-E-L-I-S-S-A dot com slash twit. Thank you, Melissa, for supporting this week in Google. Interesting uh, Hacker News thread this morning. What's happening with Gmail spam filtering? Have you noticed this? Is there more spam? The, the poster said, in the last two weeks, my Gmail inbox went from zero spam to at least two-thirds spam and phishing emails per I've day. I've seen that. Uh, so the theory, spam. Yeah, the theory is, this is really interesting, Google's mail servers have been compromised for a couple of weeks it's being used for infected crypto spam. That's, are you getting trader bot emails with attached PDFs, for example? Uh, he says, I'm no, not no. sure if they're just compromised Gmail accounts or if the mail servers themselves have been compromised. There seem to be some reports on abuse IPDB of intrusion attempts coming directly from Google's mail servers. Whoops. Uh, Google, unfortunately, uh, has declined to receive reports from SpamCop. Uh, he's been reporting it through abuse IPDB. 
Uh, here's one Google Mail server that has over 300 abuse reports. There are many more. Um, the thinking is perhaps it's 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 uh, it's coming from Google selling this. It's not clear. Uh, and maybe that even if, if Google is making money on it, but why isn't Google solving it? So apparently this is not an uncommon. Um, compromised accounts are not uncommon. I just thought I'd bring it up. I don't, you know, I, it's not a news story. Have it's I, a hacker have news you seen thread. It? Have any of you seen this on your email? I honestly stopped using Google. Uh, I used to use Google Gmail. I used to put my mail through Gmail just for the spam filtering. And then yeah. I noticed it wasn't doing a very good job, but this was years ago, five years, six years ago. So I just stopped. I just started using a spam assassin and other technologies to do my uh, spam filtering. Um, honestly, at this point for me, for spam, I just assume it's, I have the zero trust m model for spam. Yeah. I assume that every, <laughs> every email you get is spam. Is. <laughs> and so you have to kind of, instead of me trying to block spam, I try to find stuff in the spam that's okay. And so, for instance, if you're in my contact list, you get through. You know, it's things like that. Because otherwise, it's there's it's spam has gotten worse. Aunt Stacy, have you seen any change? I haven't yes, seen Stacey. anything. I haven't. No. Either. How about the Dick either. Sporting Goods email? You getting a lot of those? Nope. No. No. Okay. Um, actually, hold on. I, <laughs> this, there's a guy I here who says I'm getting that. ten Dick Sporting Goods email a day. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, and that's all spam. Yeah. So the problem um, is also for Google, it's hard for them to distinguish between spam and bacon. Bacon being mail that you asked for, perhaps accidentally signing up for a mailing list when you, yeah. you know, logged in. And so they don't want to block that because, you know, from you the point of view of the vendor, for legit they reasons, got permission, yeah. right? I get yeah, a lot, maybe of, I I get a lot of those, but, but I can't really call those spam because... I do recognize that where they come from with looking at it now. There's yeah, stuff they call that the bacon. Yeah. yeah. But it's Google a lot of just that started, every day. They've just started testing letting political spam through. Right. Because the Republicans No, again I don't want them to do that. I know. I hate, they're testing like, that now. You, you give them like an email in like... God, I donated to Act Blue. It was the worst thing I ever did. Yeah, no one donate to Act Blue. No. Go right to give it directly to the, uh, con the candidate because and ask well, them never also, to tell you. Yeah, don't say liberal things on podcasts because then people sign you up for Trump. Uh, I letters. know, I get all of those. Uh, the them. problem with uh, any political donation, it is public, it, yeah, by law. So mm -hmm. if a spammer, you know, wants to mine the political donation database, they they certainly certainly can do that. Let me see if I'm getting any Dick's Sporting Goods. Oh, I am getting a lot of Dick's. <laughs> Are they doing spam though? Really? Well, spam, though? I don't think I've ever signed up for. I've never even been into a Dix. So yeah, I don't have any in my spam any. filter. No. So I was like, I'm not going to search Dix in my uh, email at all. Yeah, yeah that's so. probably <laughs> right. that's a bad idea. So let me I'm just, like, I'm just not going to do that. Period. Gonna, I never signed up. I know because I don't even. I've never part. You know, partake. Oh, that's good. So I just clicked the unsubscribe button and I got a 400. So uh, yeah. There, yeah, there you go. There you go. Hey, it's better than... Uh, that's legit. Yeah, that's legit. Just, what was that? You just gave them a, a positive... Yeah, they said, oh, we got a sucker. Yeah. Yep. Send them more. <sighs> You're <Well>. real. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, yeah, I do, I do feel like Gmail is not... Which used to be the best way... To not get spam. Uh, Amazon's purchase of Roomba is, as we thought it might be, under FTC investigation. Yes. Well, they're asking for more records. It was going to be, the FTC was going to decide, you know, once the deal was announced, they were like, yeah, we're probably going to take a look at it. And now they're like, all right, we need way more information. So yeah. that's, yeah, that's not an investigation. Right. That's just asking for. I mean, it is an investigation technically. But it is it an invest like yeah. the FTC. When you do, when you announce a deal, the FTC can tell the companies, yeah, you can just they can just pass on doing anything with it, right? They can just be like, yeah, go ahead, <laughs> have fun. Um, they can immediately say they're going to stop it, or they can say, uh, you know what? Let's take a closer look. Yeah, give me some, 
iRobot disclosed yesterday that the FTC has formally requested documents from both companies explaining the purpose and rationale of the acquisition. Like, why you want to do this? They're also investigating Amazon's deal to buy One Life Healthcare. Same thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, iRobot said Good. both companies will cooperate and uh, expect to promptly reply. The problem is an investigation slows things down. It could take up to a year, often does. Uh, so yeah. it's all on hold until that's done, right? It so that, is. that means the, the shareholders suffer and... Even though we're trying to do this for the greater good, is that what this is about? I don't think to do it for the greater good. I think they're just trying to make. <laughs> I mean, who cares if the shareholders suffer? Honestly, I, well, there's no suffering. No money is exchanged. It just puts it. Yeah. It just delays it. But I think you know, uh, big companies these days. I mean, every time we talk about a Adobe buying Figma, it's always pending regulatory <laughs> approval. You you always run that risk. Yeah. Amazon says well, it's been big deals. a very good steward of people's data across all our businesses and that it really doesn't want any of Roomba's information about what's going on inside of people's homes. And that's like just a red herring. The issue isn't, like I said before, the issue isn't that Amazon's getting more data necessarily. The issue is that Amazon will then have the power and the tools to create the ambient home in a way that presses their goals, not the goals of other companies in the industry and or consumers. FTC is also investigating Amazon's Prime membership program. According to a legal petition Amazon filed last month, the company has asked the five-member commission to quash subpoenas tied to the probe, saying the FTC staff made excessive demands on poor little Jeff Bezos. He's busy. Don't bother him. And other company executives. Sorry, what is he doing? He's going to space. The man He's literally not even doing has... that now. He's like sailing Jesse. around on a boat. Jesse. If he can get if he can get it out under the bridge. <laughs> I saw him at the football game on a Thursday night football. Oh really? Yeah, I am a, he was there with his uh, uh paramour and uh, his main squeeze. And uh who was he sitting with? Uh some big shot, big wig. They were they were chatting and talking and all that uh very prominently featured stuff. on the broadcast i wonder why <laughs> i hate that stuff i know who cares <laughs> who cares who cares Ooh, jay-z's at the ball game today i don't care <laughs> <laughs> he's not going to convert third and one how many you of know? you uh listen to serial <laughs> it was it was the podcast that put podcasting on the map well Which, podcasting of that sort you are the podcast true put crime podcasting, podcasting. True crime podcast. It was very. Some say this is a true crime. But we don't think. Yeah, so. it's a crime. <laughs> I think they just say it's a crime. Yeah, it's a crime. Yeah. Uh, Serial, <laughs> which debuted in 2014, was uh, they did a series of uh, 12 episodes about the case uh, against a uh, at the time teenager who uh, Adnan Syed, who had been accused of strangling his high school classmate. Uh, in 1999, he was found guilty, serve, serving a life prison sentence. Uh, they examined uh, the case in, you know, with cliffhanger. I didn't actually listen, but I know a lot of people I did. did. I did a lot of cliffhanging. Yep. Yeah. Cliffhangers. Uh, they described his peculiarities of his lawyer who was disbarred and then died in 2004. Well, here we are. Uh, how many years later? Eight years later. Uh, Syed walked out of prison on Monday. His conviction was overturned thanks to the serial podcast. Well, uh, there was also, a, well, yes, but there was an investigation then by both prosecutors. Well, if it hadn't defense. had the podcast, probably That's nobody would be paying any yes. attention. I'm sure someone would argue. Judge Melissa M. Finn of Baltimore City Circuit Court vacated the conviction in the interests of justice and fairness finding that prosecutors had failed to turn over evidence that could have helped Saeed at trial. I guess that was one of the revelations of Serial, right? Yes. Uh, yes. And discovered new evidence that could have affected and the other, other possible suspects and somebody who could have been a, a, uh, a witness in his favor. The state AG was pissed as hell. Um, pissed at whom? At Serial? At this happening. Yeah, no, at, at, the state, at the city uh, prosecutor for doing this. Said he wasn't notified, wouldn't have done this, would have kept... Oh, interesting. Conviction. So you listened yeah. to the whole thing. 
I did. Uh, I, I did. should have. Well done. It, it was really, slick. Yeah, it was it's well very, done. very well done. And I should have listened because it really transformed podcasting. Now being mocked by, you know, was, uh, was it Only Murders in the Building? Yeah. That's that Steve Martin's yeah. show is is basically making fun of true crime podcasts. It's a yeah. loving tribute. Well, it, loving. it launched It launched a bunch it of, did. I mean, Boy, like serial. Serial I mean, never word. succeeded as well as the first episode. Nobody was ever able to duplicate their amazing success in the first series. Right. Um, so do you think Jeff's serial was legit? Like they, or were they trying to stir up interest to, for the interest of a podcast? Well, it's like any, any crime reporter ever has in New York daily news. We did the same thing, you know, the, the case of the missing nun, you know, right. we do that kind of stuff. Uh, we go back in the files and find old cases. Do you think it, so it's, so it's, it's a, a, it's a longstanding order. tradition. Yeah. What, yeah. Uh, was it was it straining credulity or did you? It was it, no. It was well done. It did not come to a conclusion. It did not say he was innocent. It led you that direction, but did not come to a conclusion. Yeah. Um, and the family of the victim is very upset by this and thinks that it was a legitimate um, verdict. And the thing is, this is life. Life is messy. You never know. You, the, right. the things aren't certain. Prosecutors and, uh, uh, recommended that his conviction be vacated and that he be granted a new trial because they said the state no longer has confidence in the integrity of the uh, conviction. So the, the podcast right. convinced people. That's key. That's key. And um, they don't know what they haven't yet said whether they're going to try him again or not. Well, He's on home uh, detention. He's out of prison, but on home detention until they decide. Hmm. So it is podcast. What have you done, Leo? You know, that podcast got somebody out of prison. What the heck have you done Nothing, all these years? Not Jeez. compared to Nothing. that. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, I can't remember the, the audience numbers for the, were through the roof. I mean, it really was. It put yeah, podcasting it on the map at the time. Uh, Mr. Ms. Lee, the victim's brother, uh, said uh, when asked about the podcast, this is not a podcast for me. This is real life, a never-ending nightmare for 20-plus years. He felt betrayed and blindsided by the motion to vacate and frustrated with the many turns in the case of the last two decades. Whenever I think it's over and it's ended, it's always coming back. It's killing me and it's killing my mother. Ugh. Of course, if you if, if you if you were a family, how many? 3.4 million. Wow. If you were in the family, we do that almost every month. If you were in the family of the victim and you thought they had the wrong guy and the real guy was wandering around, you would want this to be re-examined, But they don't right? think they got the wrong guy, is what they're saying. Yeah. But yeah, they've, they've bought heavily into that, which, I mean, I get it. If Every time the wrong be... guy is convicted, the right guy is walking free. Yes. Right. Yes. Hmm. So were you convinced, Jeff? I was convinced he had a bad trial. I was convinced he should have had a retrial. Yeah. yeah. So that, that much, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there was also a documentary on HBO, which came out a couple of years ago. Um, New York Times bought serial productions in 2020. So it's now a uh, part of the New York Times family of podcasts. They never quite got that that many. Uh, it's hard. No. That's catching lightning in a bottle, isn't it? It really, really is. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about helium. <laughs> Stacy time. Helium. So uh, the first time I ever heard about helium was you. You have a helium router. I do. I have a hotspot that is a Laura hotspot. Low range, and long range. Long range. Long range. And and the idea is yeah. people use it and generate helium crypto tokens for you. So the idea is by having this hotspot, I am providing a node in a Laura WAM network that Helium offers out to companies who want to use it. They send their LoRaWAN data to my hotspot, and then it goes over my home Wi-Fi to the public internet. In return for doing this, I get a Helium network token, which is the Helium's cryptocurrency, which then I can exchange either to buy data credits on the Helium network if I want to operate my own sensors, or I just sell for cash money based on how much h and are exchanging on. They are not exchanging for much now. So that's the question. Have you made money on this? I did. I made a lot of money in the beginning and I sold it. So I, I made actual money. 
Um, <laughs> I made fiat currency. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I made probably see how much you made back then. Seattle, last year so. I made fifteen, fifteen or eighteen thousand dollars. Wow! So yeah, it was great. Um, I, and and is, and you're not making much now. I can tell you right now that I think it's worth. Well, I, don't know, I never know what it's worth at the. I never checked it. So part of it was I didn't check it for a long time, and then when I checked it, it was like eight thousand dollars, and then all of a sudden it had the super run up, and then it was like. A lot of money and i was like oh holy cow i should sell um right now i have oh it's 565 dollars. okay and uh, how much how many months so, is that since when yeah well so there, there's two issues one i'm generating fewer hts in the beginning to set up the network they incentivize people by giving them more hts but mm -hmm. also the value of hts has dropped precipitously like at mm -hmm. its high point the price of an HT, like when i sold it was like 15 to 20 dollars and now it's at four dollars and 30 cents so, so there's a couple things but so has there. bitcoin which is like now at eighteen thousand yeah. dollars so as eth which is now at 1200 bucks i mean all the all the cryptocurrencies have dropped yeah. quite a bit so that may not be a helium issue um so the reason i bring no. it up is helium has, has made an announcement they're partnering with t-mobile yeah they're going to make helium so mobile a 5g wireless service for smartphones using i think using your router right using the helium no 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 so it is the same sort of model but it is not the same my router only does lora and wi-fi ah so it's you too slow to, to do anything useful it doesn't have the right radio inside i mean okay it's a totally different wireless network. this is so going to be 5g, 5G yeah yeah for 5g you have to buy a different type of router and it's much more expensive. It ranges from eighteen hundred to about ten thousand oh. dollars for this router, because you are because a five G radio is inherently more expensive and more complicated. You're also going to need backhaul for any five G. Um, you could use your Wi Fi network, and I actually asked Helium. Um, I was like, "Hey, how are you going to handle this? Because like five G is a lot." Um, and I asked, uh, "Okay, this is verbatim what they sent me." I said, "Hey." How does the Helium 5G hotspot handle large data requests on a user's broadband account? Are there limits? They answered me, this move will allow 5G infrastructure to be accessible at a much faster pace by enabling the Helium community to help build and use the network, especially in hard to reach places. So the answer is they're not answering. Right. Uh, so I don't know how you could actually do this reasonably and what kind of data speed you could expect on this network. But if you are a subscriber, you can buy, if you are a T-Mobile subscriber, you can now buy basically, um, well, let me rephrase that. You can buy a Helium Mobile subscription that will run on the Helium 5G network and Timo's 5G network. Most of the time it's going to be on Timo's 5G network. So according um, to the article in Decrypt, uh, Helium has 950,000 node operators, including Stacy Higginbotham. They mention you by name. Uh, no, they don't. Uh, so that's a, you know that's pretty widespread. But as you say, not but nearly widespread Laura. enough to provide he 5G. Helium's own they only 5 have 4,500 5G networks. Oh, 4, that's uh, networks. that's a little deceptive. Okay, that's the for the IoT speed. Uh, yeah, Laura they have network. two, and they have two separate tokens. They have the HNTs, which is their IoT, uh, and then they have what they call mobile, and all caps. And those are so the five G network. So, and so there's hardly the anybody Helium's, has the helium. You said it was eighteen thousand uh, dollars. <laughs> it's between eighteen hundred and oh, 1, five thousand dollars. Okay, but yeah. so it's very still, few I mean, people have those. Right, only forty five hundred of them are okay. in operation. Helium's own 5G network will be the preferred network from Helium Mobile when coverage is available, which is never. <laughs> uh, <laughs> initially, voice calls will take place entirely on T-Mobile's network, while data transfers will use service provided by node operators in the decentralized network when available. Otherwise, it falls back to T-Mobile. So it would it'll behave probably like any other T-Mobile NVNO initially. But with less coverage. Well, where, it'll, where have T, it'll have T-Mobile. It'll use T-Mobile if we'll it can't get anything else. Yes. Yeah. So it'll be and, just like a T-Mobile nice MVNO. Is, but maybe if you're near somebody who has if a 5G If you're near someone else's hots. 
yeah. And the idea is hopefully people will buy these. Like if you're a WISP operator, like a wireless infrastructure provider in the middle of Lake Wisconsin, right? You might want to put one of these up because you already have the infrastructure. Right. And if you can earn money when, because TiVo doesn't have a 5G network in the middle of nowhere of Wisconsin, but you know, maybe people would use it if it were. So the and analog kind of to this is Xfinity's uh, cell service, which is a Verizon MVNO. If you're near an Xfinity router that's connected to the internet, yeah. you'll use that. Otherwise, you'll use Verizon. Uh, there are a exactly. lot more Xfinity routers out there, but it's the same idea. You can bootstrap, in effect, bootstrap your network by starting as an There are MVNO. 20 million Xfinity routers out there because there are yeah. 20 million it's Comcast Xfinity subscribers. Right. Wow. Well, not all of us turn on our routers. I don't. That is true. So if yeah. you... If you don't use the Comcast modem, okay, you're right, you're right. Leah. And the and the if I have a Helium five G node, I, do I I make money just like you do on your other Helium mm -hmm. node? Yeah, when someone comes on your, you'll you'll make it by proof of stake, or sorry, 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 proof of coverage. Like, hey, I'm here. Hey, is she really here? Okay, yeah, great. So money. so we've talked. In and fact, we were talking before data. the show about proof of work, which is how Bitcoin works. Proof of stake, which is how the new Ethereum works. And there's also proof of coverage, which is not doing math problems, I think, just saying hello. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. it's basically saying, hello, hello, are you really here? Yes, yes. I'm really here. Oh, good. You get cha-ching, you get a coin. Okay. Yeah. Actually, or you the, get a tenth of a coin. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they'll be talking about the Ethereum emerge. Uh, I think they did, actually, on Tech News Weekly last Thursday. As far as we could tell, it went absolutely smoothly, flawlessly. So Ethereum has moved from proof of work, which is a very environmentally unfriendly system that one Bitcoin uses and Ethereum used to use, to proof of stake, which they say saves 99% of the power that a proof of work uh, protocol does. Uh, and apparently did it flawlessly. Not that the Ethereum has not gone down in value, but so has Bitcoin. The real losers in this are the miners, the Ethereum miners who had the big ASICs and the GPUs and we're making money off of mining Ethereum because they won't be making that kind of money uh, anymore. In fact, article in PC Magazine from last week, no one is profitable. GPU mining faces dark days after Aww. Ethereum merge. Yeah. Oh, it also means you'll be able to find a lot of GPUs on eBay. Yeah. I'm not sure I'd buy them. Uh, the merge. The cost of power should go down. The, the merge killed it all off, said one miner named Philip Robb. All my stuff is idling now. Uh, initially, miners were hoping to shift to alternative cryptocurrencies like Ergo and Ravencoin, which can also be mined with PC graphics cards, but they're so worthless and the electricity is so expensive that you're just not going to make money. It, it's so I asked you these the people that are using, that are doing the mining, are they all US-based or where? Well, I'm for a while they were in China. doesn't have the same electricity right. rates that we have here. Right. So a lot they were uh, for a lot of them were in China until China booted them out because they were they would be next door to uh, hydroelectric dams where the electricity was virtually free. Then you can make money, but you can't in California. There's no way you can make money. Uh, we have a friend Steve Gibson and I have a good friend in Arizona who makes money because his electricity rates are low. Um, I guess if you had solar in a state like Arizona, you might be it might, it might be profitable, but not anymore. I guess is the point. Not yeah. anymore. I would figure like some of the rural European, it might not be as much of an issue to right. mine. Right. You know, some miners are taking a wait and see approach, says PC Magazine, on the possibility that GPU mining could make a comeback one day. He's uh, Blake Teeter says he only plans to sell his older generation GPUs. I'm cleaning my rigs and watching the market until a few coins stand out to mine profitability wise. I think mm -hmm. GPU mining will still have a place in crypto mining at least for a few years. It's also made up. It's also yeah. amazing. But Leo, I asked you before the show to explain uh, uh, proof of stake to me. So normally uh, the way Bitcoin and all, most cryptocurrencies originally were designed, uh, you would make money by solving tough math problems. In order for a transaction to go through, let's say I want to give you uh, a Bitcoin, uh, I then have to... Uh, uh, offer an amount of money for the transaction. There's a default amount, but if you want the transaction to go through faster, you might give a bigger percentage of the transaction. And then it goes out to all the Bitcoin miners 
who attempt to solve the problem. They're all working on it at the same time. The first one to solve it gets the transaction fee, the gas fee. So what you have is, is this uh, duplication of effort across the whole. All the miners are working full steam trying to commit oh. stuff to the blockchain. Proof of stake doesn't have that lottery system. Or it actually does have a lottery system. It doesn't have that system. It, it says it picks one miner, says you get the transaction fee. Uh, it doesn't necessarily reduce gas fees, but it keeps everybody from mining for the same coin. So it uh, and it, what does that and th that miner? Because all what I read about it is that miner verifies. Is that miner also solving a problem? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's just not going. Oh, I see. That's the difference. Is that is that it's just going to one block per miner, basically. And so you're presuming a trust there because that miner doesn't want to ruin their trust if they screw it up. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, that's my understanding. I'm sure I got it a little bit wrong, but. <laughs> they Sly Ferret in the chat room says they solve for blocks of transactions, not individual transactions. Well, yeah, they bundle them, but you get the idea. You get the idea. I so just put a link from CoinDesk. That's yeah, I see that explaining the differences. Yeah. Um, two different methods to validate transactions. The whole idea of blockchain. The whole idea of all of this is you have a decentralized ledger that everybody who has a copy of the blockchain knows all the transactions that happen on the blockchain. So, so it's all simultaneously public and decentralized so that you know no bank runs it it's just run by every it's a consensus mechanism mm -hmm. uh and uh in theory that works better but you know i think there's certainly applications for a distributed database and uh, obviously but not as many as one might think <laughs> it works just fine the cost i saw somewhere the cost of a, a Bitcoin transaction compared to a hundred thousand Visa transactions, and it's 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 like a hundred times higher than a hundred thousand Visa transactions. It's just not a sensible way of doing it, at all. I heard you mention that. I think it was Sunday. Yeah, yeah. On I think it was Sunday. I yeah. heard you talking. About. I was like, who? Whoa! It was. I, I wish I could find the story because I wonder yeah. where their source come from. Because that's a big well. No, I mean everybody number. knows it's it's a very significant Ooh. amount of energy. Uh, used uh, proof of work required. This is from the uh, CoinDesk article. Proof of work requires a significant amount of energy to verify transactions. Since the computers on the network must spend a lot of energy and operate a lot, the blockchain is less environmentally friendly than other systems. By a lot, I added. Another problem some raise is that because of the competition between miners for rewards, a small number of mining pools control the blockchain, a kind of de facto centralization. That's what happened in NFTs, by the way. OpenSea basically yeah, dominates. Exactly. It's important to note, though, that mining pools are made up of individual miners or smaller groups of miners who are free to pull their hash power if they no longer agree with the direction of the larger mining pool. The downsides of proof of stake is that it requires an often enormous in initial investment. You must purchase enough of the native token of that cryptocurrency to qualify to be a validator, which is dependent on the size of the network. In theory, people must be wealthy or earn enough money to buy a network stake. Or you can buy a stake in the stake. I wonder, yeah. Leading to an exclusive Yeah, you can do that. But then, but then again, that's centralization. Yeah. It's 32 ETHs, I think, you have to have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could right. Bitcoin do what ETH just did? What made ETH able to do this? It was a promise of Ethereum from the very beginning. They, they said uh, they also had to achieve yeah. consensus, right? Yeah. So if you got enough people to agree to do it on Bitcoin, then yes, you could. Got it. Yeah, it's just math. It's just you know, it's just an algorithm. You change the algorithm, I guess. Um, well, yeah, but you have to get enough. You have to get a fifty-one percent, or maybe it's more. Right. To agree to decide of, that that's the new math we all want to follow. All of this has roiled the GPU market. Uh, one of the biggest GPU manufacturers, EVGA, has announced that they're out of the business entirely. 80% of their revenue comes from making NVIDIA GeForce GPUs. They're cutting their ties with NVIDIA saying it's it's just a it's a bad business. It's a bad business. A lot it's of us have EVGA made up cards. Thing. Yeah. Wow. This is uh, the problem. Uh, NVIDIA's gross margin has been going up, up, and up. Uh, meanwhile, the people who make the cards are profit 
The profit's been going down, down and down. Uh, EVGA is just one of those partners. So it's not a good, it's not a good business. And NVIDIA is suffering too, frankly. They just announced new cards though. So maybe that'll, I don't know. We'll see. The market's changing. Well, and they also have, there is a legitimate market that is not driven by right. financial speculation for NVIDIA's products. There's three. So, as, as far as I know, there's PC gaming's, artificial intelligence, and driverless cars. Those are big markets for NVIDIA. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's also like transcoding. There's a lot. There's there's right. a lot. <laughs> right, right. All right, let's take a little break. Uh, can it be? Wait a minute. Before we take a break, I think I have to do a change log and stuff. Shoot. Oh, there's some other, there's some other good stories EVGA here. Thing. I know there's other good stories, but uh, dude, we're already at an hour 48. I got to oh. do the picks of the week. Life has oh, to Jesus. go on. I, I can't keep clock. doing it. I had to go get my waffle. I was hungry. Uh -huh. It's you see? already four o'clock. All right. Let me, see, let me see real quick. Uh, Clearview oh. story is interesting. Yeah, no. Robert no. Kinsel, <laughs> former chief business officer of YouTube. You mentioned he left YouTube. He's going to Warner Music. Going to run <laughs> Warner Music. Clearview used by police to find criminals now in public defenders' hands. Oh, boy. After Florida man accused of vehicular homicide, his lawyer used their facial recognition software to prove his innocence. So there was a guy who was in the passenger, that guy was in the passenger seat in a car. Um, the driver in a bad crash was thrown out. A good Samaritan pulled him out. The door, the passenger door was jammed, so it pulled him out through the driver's door. And then the cops said, you were the driver. Oh. You're a homicide. And they didn't, the cops didn't get the name of the um, good Samaritan. Even though they interviewed him, they didn't get the name. And they said, yep, you're it. You're going to jail. And so the lawyers said they had images from the police video of the good Samaritan. Um, and they needed to use Clearview to match face and find the real person. And uh, they called the Clearview CEO and they said, well, okay, we'll try this because it's mainly only used for police. And in this case, uh, they found the person and this person said, yes, absolutely. I pulled him out from the passenger side. He was not the driver of the car and the guy's not going to jail as a result. Now, what's wrong in this story is the prosecution and the police were all messed up. They shouldn't have gone after this guy in this way and they should have done their job and gotten the documentation and all of that. Yeah, Nonetheless... It was technology that's that's decried and properly so for use by police only. If it's also in the hands of defense, then shouldn't it be in both hands at least? That's the story. So, yeah, I it's technology it is a tool and the police are lazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't want to do that story. Uh, okay. Let's see. what. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Uh, I try. I try. No, we did the uh, story. Co I'm joking. Uh, David AI is shorts. going to go ahead. AI is is it going to is it going to eliminate coding? No, it's not. I triple E story. No, no it's no. not. But it's going to make people more dependent. And by the way, interesting stat. Uh, it's not a number this week. I'll use it anyway. A bonus number is that within about a year, American colleges and universities will graduate more computer science majors alone than all humanities. Which means there's going to be a glut. Yeah. And also we need that more English teachers. Humanities. Yeah. We do. And we need no, more we anthropologists. Yeah, we need more hey. plumbers. Yeah, that's what we need. Bingo. We need more plumbers. We need, we need more, more carpenters, robots. plumbers, handymen, people who can saw. We also need more historians and philosophers. No, we and don't. We got plenty of those. Yes, we do. I was putting brake pads on my car the other day, and I kept getting messages from people, and I'm like, yeah, I'm busy changing my brakes. And it's like it amazed people that somebody else would work on their car. And I'm like, do y'all not do this? Apparently not. No. So I'm like, oh. Because you can't anymore because yeah. you need a computer. <laughs> Did I tell you the story of my, the one time wrench. I tried to change my oil? <laughs> No, oh, you tried to change your oil. Let so me I guess. Was young you, in Chicago, you had your face under the hole. I was under. <laughs> I was under the car, and I was convinced by a coworker. You know, you can do this, Jeff. You can really do this. So I went and bought all this stuff. Yeah, you just unscrew the and, thing. And, right? and, yeah, it just and comes no, right out. no. I got the. I was under the car on the street in Chicago on the, on the upper, uh, you know, on the, on the north side, and I got the, the the round thing on the on the oil. First, I took the the, the nut off, got all the oil out, so there's okay. no oil in the Good car. Start. Right? Okay. Good start. Right, and then I take the thing to try to get the filter off. Yeah. Yeah. 
and I wreck the filter, but can't get it off. Uh, so now I have a car that has no oil no in it. oil and no filter. And if oh. I put oil in it, what comes schmutz it out of the <laughs> filter. So I had to have the car towed. Towed. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, how about humiliation? Humiliation. Somebody Oops. of ants' uh, uh, talents driving the tow truck saying, you idiot. Did you have the special you... filter wrench? Yes, I did. I did. Mm -hmm. I got there and all I did was took a big screwdriver and stuck it through and then turned it and it came off. <laughs> I've never tried to change my oil again. That's hilarious. And I certainly aunt wouldn't be changing my brakes. Yeah, I'm nah. so sorry, Jeff. My yeah. dad taught me how to change my spark plugs. That's we good. Used to, yeah, we used to do all that. Can't do that anymore, but now you don't do that anymore. That's a skill a, you don't need. need. A computer. It, but see, but this is the outfit I would be... wear if I were doing it. Uh huh. Rosie, <laughs> Rosie the Riveter over here. Girl power. Uh, let's do the Google change log. Otherwise, we'll never get out of here. The Google change log. Google Fi offering free service. If you were a Fi customer and you stopped, expect an email from Fi saying, please come back. Free service for the rest of the year. Uh, if if invited, and you, you'll get an email if you are, you and up to five other people get three months of free service, uh, which is about 720 bucks if you have all six lines going. If you are an existing Google Fi user, That'll be the normal fee. Thank you very much. No deal for you. No deal. Uh, this is actually a much more useful story. Google app starts rolling out results about you to help remove personal information. Google said they'd be able to do this. So here's the deal. You have to be using the Google app. Take control of results about you. Your personal info is yours to share or not. We're here to help you remove personal info you see on Google. And you can have requests. You can say, uh, you know, what you want removed from where. Google will then do it. You'll have to say, uh, answer the question, why would you like to remove this result? It shows my personal contact info. It shows my contact info with an intent to harm me. It shows other personal info. It contains illegal info or it's an outdated. Remember, they announced this at Google I.O. It's now appearing in Europe and the U.S. Not wide, though. This stage, they're doing it slowly, so... Mm -hmm. um, it's important to note, says Google, when we receive a removal request, we'll evaluate all con content on the web page to ensure we're not limiting the availability of other information that is broadly useful, for instance, in news articles. Remember, they said that because that was the question. Is, are you going to remove news articles? No. Removing contact information from Google search does not remove it for the web, which is why you may wish to contact the web hosting site directly. There is so much, you know, revenge porn and stuff like that on the web i think this is a good thing for google to uh, to do there have been companies that make a lot of money trying to do this but really google's going to be the the king of this one google's to-do list and reminders will finally work together google is working on a big update to google tasks integrating its reminder sister across a system across assistant calendar and the rest of the google suite of apps uh, that's good right uh, Google I tasks. I never put things on a to-do list because then I don't do them. If they're on your to-do list, you consider that done? No, no, then I fear them and they and they uh -oh. hang over me. They're scary. Uh, like torture. And yes, then, then that's the worst thing I can do is put it on a to-do list. So if you have a Google Assistant, you might try saying something like, hey, you know who, remind me to take out the trash at nine. It will then get added to your tasks uh, as well as your reminders. I think that's good. What was Gina's? Isn't that always uh, what happened? App? No, there were two separate things. No, if no you said remind things. me to put it on the so reminders. So I just got a reminder and it wasn't on my yeah. to-do. Okay, yeah, I don't care. I think that's right. perfect, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Gina had one called to-do.txt, which is a command line-based text to-do program. I don't know if she maintains it or somebody else does. It's open source. Might somebody Let's might go to the command that. line. Yeah. Remind ourselves. I have terminal. I, have, terminal. I often... Go to terminal. Terminal. <laughs> Baby, It's it all comes down to Emacs in the end. Are you using Stadia? Are you a pro member? Look for 1440p quality. It's rolling out. Of course, cool. you'll have to have a lot of bandwidth to do that, I would imagine. Uh, YouTube's partner program is expanding so that people who do shorts will get some revenue. The revenue nice. sharing yeah, program. And there also is a creator music catalog coming, 
with licensed music. Uh, to Hank join to the thread, to you, say this is a big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal, but you got to be a, a pretty active. You have to have 10 million views of your shorts over 90 days and a thousand channel subscribers. My God. Oh, I guess and? that's like going viral on TikTok. Yeah, th 10 million views seems like a lot to have in That's in a lot. I didn't, I didn't know it was an and. I thought it was an or. Yeah, it's a plus. 40,000 valid public watch hours. But, uh, you know, you'll get you'll get some money, I guess. And uh, like the 20th of the month, that's when YouTube sends out their pay. Do you get a check? Oh, yeah. I always get beer money from YouTube. So, so, so that's good. It's quite nice. And then when I saw the news about shorts, I was like, well, maybe I could put more into shorts. But oh, I didn't see works. that that and clause. Yeah. That well, you, you know what? Google's numbers, YouTube's numbers are so inflated. Maybe 10 million is not as much as it sounds. I don't know. And they're short. The idea is this is Google's TikTok competitor. Yeah, yeah. right. And I always yeah, told but even Henry, on TikTok, 10, 10, 10 million is a lot of views. Like yeah, that's a okay. lot. That's Google a lot. has begun, this is for you, uh, Stacey. Google has begun testing Matter update for the Nest Hub Max. Mm -hmm. We'll give uh, your Max bridge and extender features. I have one of these Nest Hub Maxes. I am, if you have the, yeah, if you have their, you can actually get their SDK and run Matter today if you want. Oh, what will that give me? If they approve you. Oh. Um, if you have any Thread devices in your house that are also running on Thread. Which I probably do. To... I might not know it, but I probably do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. How would you know? If you have Thread devices? Yeah. Do you have any Eve devices? No. Eve's one of them. How about Wink? Eve's the one... Um, the wink. How about no, smart that things? Thing is, no, no, those are not smart. How about things hue lights? Hardware. No, but uh, nano leaves. Nano leaves. Okay. The I'm newer just, nano leaves. I'm not hip with the kids. You're just guess. messing with me. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. Chrome's in incognito <laughs> tab can now require your fingerprint on Android. Seems that's the opposite of incognito. That's the opposite of what you want. Beginning. So. You could oh, How this is to, oh, this I is guess to lock somebody... to lock your incognito tabs. Oh, oh okay. so you can have some incognito tabs open. They'll be locked, and then nobody will be able to see them unless you prove it's you. Okay, that's fine. Oh, so no one will look at your porn if they pick up your phone to look at your photos. There's no porn on my. Got phone. it. What phone? What porn? Just saying. I, I just, just just as TikTok is good enough. <laughs> uh, look in the privacy and security settings. There will be a switch lock incognito tabs when you leave Chrome. Turn that on and you can have it be fingerprint based as well. Good. And that's the Google change log. <laughs> Honey, can you give me your fingerprint on your phone, please? <laughs> <laughs> Honey, uh, just show me your face for a second. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm wise to your tricks. All right. Uh, let's take a break. When we come back, your picks of the week, if you will. Thank you very much. This episode of This Week in Google is brought to you by SecureWorks. SecureWorks is a leader in cybersecurity building solutions for security experts by security experts. SecureWorks offers superior threat detection and rapid incident response all while making sure that customers are never locked into a single vendor. SecureWorks offers an open, extended detection and response platform called Tagus XDR. Why? Well, <laughs> why do you have to ask? In 2022, cybercrime is going to cost the world $7 trillion. By 2025, that number is going to be $10.5 trillion. Last year, ransomware totaled $20 billion in damages. Attacks occurred every 11 seconds. It's estimated by 2031. Ransomware will cost $265 billion a year and strike every two seconds. How do you make sure your organization is not the next victim? The answer, SecureWorks Tagus XDR. SecureWorks Tagus provides superior detection, identifying over 470 billion security events every day. Prioritizing the true positive alerts 
eliminating alert noise and allowing organizations to focus on the real threat. In addition, Tages offers unmatched response with automated response actions to eliminate threats before the damage is ever done. Whether your organization has a limited IT staff and budget or you run a well-funded, fully staffed security operations center, you'll receive customized support. With SecureWorks Tages Managed XDR, you can easily leverage SecureWorks experts to investigate and respond to threats on your behalf. That cuts dwell times, decreases operational burdens, and reduces cost. And with 24 7 by 365 coverage, whether you experience a Christmas Day security event or half your team's out sick, you can trust SecureWorks is there behind you. Many companies are facing a shortage of security talent. Hiring and retention are harder than ever. SecureWorks customizes the approach and the coverage level you get in order to give you exactly what you need. Bottom line, SecureWorks acts as an extension of your security team on day one, alleviating cybersecurity talent caps. And what happens if you've already found an intruder in your system? There's no need to worry. Just write down this number, 1-800-BREACHED. 1-800-BREACHED. That number will connect you with the SecureWorks Emergency Incident Response Team, and they can provide you with immediate assistance 24-7 in responding to and remediating a possible cyber incident or data breach. And you see there on the website, that's for the U.S. and Canada, but regional numbers are also available. But if you're in the U.S. or Canada, 1-800-BREACHED. At SecureWorks, you can learn more about the ways today's threat environment is evolving and the risks it can present to your organization, including case studies, reports from their counter threat unit, and more. Visit SecureWorks.com slash twit to get a free trial of Tages XDR. That's SecureWorks.com slash twit. SecureWorks, defending every corner of cyberspace. Thank you, SecureWorks, for supporting us this week in Google. Let us get a thing. Story? Yeah, you got one more story. Okay. Well, I'm just going to ask your opinion about it. I was curious. What, uh, uh, we saw this coming, but, but Spotify going heavy in audiobooks. Yeah, I mean, 300,000. Uh, I can't remember what Audible has. I think it's a good thing. Audible really dominates right now. It's a monopoly, in effect, Amazon's Audible. Uh, there's others. There's Libro.fm and there's Downpour. And Apple. Uh, Apple sells Audible books. Uh, oh. Google, I think, also sells Audible books. I don't remember where Google gets its books. Uh, but Audible really is kind of 90% of the market. So uh, in a way, I think that's good. Uh, you're going to pay per book. It's not a uh, subscription. Right. And they're well, not... split it up where you, where you want a given book and it's going to be on Spotify, not on Audible? Or that was my, is it going to no. fragment the market? No, because no. they make deals with publishers, right? Okay. So, uh, you know, Random House has its books on a variety of services. Audible does its own exclusives, which is very smart. And that's see, yes. this is uh, this is Spotify trying to get out from under the thumb of the record industry. They they are completely at the mercy of whatever the record industry decides. If they want to charge more, Spotify pays more. If they charge less, Spotify pays less. So you know, and if and if Taylor Swift doesn't like Spotify, that's it. So Spotify is looking for alternate revenue streams. Podcasts clearly are, right. you know, a big right. focus. They've spent, I think they said they were going to spend, was it $500 million on uh, podcasts? They acquired a bunch of companies. They bought Joe Rogan's show. Uh, they bought a bunch of other shows for exclusive. Uh, I think they've spent more than a billion now, actually, at this point. Jeez. So this makes sense. You know, spoken word content, it's not music. Uh, I don't know if you're a Spotify listener. I guess you don't mind living in the app, right? Yeah. I mean, okay. I guess I I have my Spotify app open more often than not. Uh, I think really a lot of it is also uh, to me anyway. Uh, the deals these companies make with uh, smart speakers. Do you listen when you listen to an audio book? Do you listen on a smart speaker or do you listen? On no, headphones, sometimes. Usually, I no my speaker's not smart. Well, I listen in the car, <laughs> so that's just the phone paired to the car. But I will, uh, because it's audible, I'll ask Echo uh, to play. I, I'll say, "Read to me," and it reads my book, unless it instead decides to play a, a movie from Netflix that I didn't ask for. But usually, it reads my book. Uh, so, Audible is a sponsor. I should mention. Um, 
uh, and I'm certainly not rooting against him. I'm kind of like an audible fanatic. Yeah, but, so am I. But I think it's good to have competition. Yeah, I think, and of course, Simon and Schuster says yes. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> uh, competition also means perhaps, um, you know, they can they can get a better deal from some of these companies. Um, Aud according to the Times, Audible is by far the biggest audiobook retailer, with more than seven hundred sixty thousand titles, many of them originals. Um. Daniel Eck of Spotify says the company is prepared to invest heavily in order to compete with Audible. Just as we've done in podcasting, expect us to play to win. Oh, I didn't even know they were playing to win. Oh, no. <laughs> what does that mean, Daniel? Play to win. You're competing against okay, me? We, can, we, can't com we can't make fun of people for their mind. I mean, we can't, but it's silly. Well, who they're, are they competing with? Spotter. I understand with, with audiobooks are competing with Audible, I guess. Who are they competing with with podcasts? All the Apple. little independent podcasts. I'll well, that's you, the, yeah, I'll give you the answer. Because I know they're competing with the ecosystem. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Hey. Or the ecosystem. The eco echo, it's all the same to me. <laughs> Stacy Higginbotham, your thing of the week. Okay, so I, I, I don't, did y'all talk about this? Because it's really important. Yeah, did did. y'all talk about yeah. this last week? Uh, <laughs> yeah, my we we talked, story we about it we matter? About it. No, what, you know, your story? Okay. No. What, yeah. what was your I don't, story? I don't usually promote my own stuff, y'all. So promote it with me. But I did on my newsletter last week, and I think it came out Monday, maybe five ways matter will disappoint users at launch. For a second there, I thought I typed lunch in my headline. It was like, oh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I think this is important to talk about because I have been really extolling the virtues of matter. And I spent last week in Austin eating tacos and attending this particular oh, event. That's where you were. Ah. That's a secret. Nothing ah. is really secret in my life. Um, and I have to say, you should check this out because there's matter is, it's not going to be a failure, but it is not going to be as cool as we all wanted it to be. And uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is it's very complicated. And so things are going to break for like heavy users. And I think that's really important to note. Um, anyway, so I, y'all should just check this out if your matters, you know, if you're interested in that. So what's a heavy, you mean heavy user means, I don't understand. Well, like, so some things like, if you are someone who has lots of complicated routines, matter is probably not going to help you very much. Oh. If you want to, like my home, when I switch over to matter, it might be rough going. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Developers, like one of the biggest promises of matter was that developers would be able to build once and right. won't need it. But since 2019, when it was launched, there's been a lot of, programs on top of that. So things like Google's home device SDK and intelligence clusters, um, Amazon's ambient home developer kit, where they're like trying to tell your stuff if you're home or away or not, that all is way above matter. So you're still going, if you're a developer, you're oh. still going to have to focus on those. Right. So that's kind of sucky. Um, what else? Is so sucky? matter is really a low level interface. It's not super low level yeah. and like a lot of the value like a lot of your devices too, one of the other values was that you weren't going to have as many apps, right? Like I was really looking forward to dumping a lot of my like one-off apps. That's probably not going to be the case for things like my smart plugs that track energy monitoring. The energy monitoring isn't going to come through on Matter, so I'm going to still need that. Even your lock apps are going to have like setting codes and things like that might not be supported with Matter. So it's just... They overpromise. They're going to underdeliver. It'll get better over time, but it's still like, I think this is probably a good level set. And I'm a little so sad. where would you at this point would recommend people go for a capable home hub? <sighs> I mean, all of them will the, support matter eventually. Yes. Well, I mean, like the big ones. Yes. I think if you are just a normal person who wants some convenience like lights, if you're an Apple user, do HomeKit. If you're a Google or Amazon person, you can do those too. Most normal people should not be like smart things is is nice. I like it, but it's too much for like normal people. If Even I if use you're HomeKit, not worried about, like, 
Do I also get access to matter capabilities? Can it talk to other devices? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So you're you're really choosing the higher level interface is going to come from whatever system you choose, and matter is really an interoperability layer, so that you can have multiple devices in the same house. It's an interoperability. It's so you don't have to sit there and like when you're buying a light bulb, go, oh, crap, does this work with Madame A or right. does this work with right. G? Mm -hmm. Well, but you can see that it works with a matter light bulb is going to have like, all okay. those logos. It's not going to just stop with the matter logo. It's going to have all not. Those. Well, yeah, that someone else was very upset over that. They're like, I still have to do all the logos. I was like, oh, sorry. They're like so many badges. Right. Um, but. Prior to this, you didn't actually know, like, you know, like your ring sensors don't work with your Google stuff. And now if you buy a ring, a matter sensor, a matter security sensor, or sorry, a ring security sensor that's matter certified, it will talk to your Google home. Am I, am I, I feel like I'm not unusual in thinking, I, ain't nobody got time for this. This is, <laughs> this is like, I got more important f things to do than this. That's fair. Well, that's anyway, that's my it's not really a thing. Also, Kevin reviewed a Laura Wind or a Laura developer kit. So if you're I saw that, you built one. Or was that was that was Kevin Kevin's did. article. That's Kevin. Oh. I was so impressed. I, I thought you did it. Got, I, I got mean, your little soldering on. No, she out. was busy changing the oil of the car. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I could have done it, but Kevin In the loves Tesla? like <laughs> Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I nice. was busy plugging it in. Yeah. I mean, Kevin loves that stuff. And right. I got to give him fun stuff because I got to write all the boring business stuff that he doesn't want. Ooh, to do. yeah, yeah. See? Yeah. Nice. And so now that he's got it going, what did he do with it? He's just sending data today. Oh, he okay. asked for good. Uh, he was like, send project in the show that comes out tomorrow. He asked for project ideas. Okay. Nice. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's a sweet little kit. It's kind of pricey. And the Sparrow as someone pointed Development out, Kit. Yeah. It's Ray Ozzy's company. Oh, is it? Oh. oh. Yeah. Blues Wireless is Ray Ozzy's latest company. Well, that's a step down. What's he going to so do rude. next? Is he going to sell fireplace Oof. inserts? What's this? Is, this is, <laughs> well, it's connectivity. He was like a big shot of Microsoft. He, he created well, he, Lotus Notes. Lotus Notes. <laughs> now he's doing like boxes to connect things. No, he's doing, he, no, he's doing connectivity plans for IoT devices. Shh. It'll uh, be big. It'll Go be on. huge. Someday. Someday it'll be huge. I was not prepared for the dig against Ray Ozzy. So uh, much. Geez, yeah. Are you buddies? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. We live in the same place. He's on the island? My favorite uh, island? No, he lives in Seattle. Oh, yeah. Your favorite island's Mercer. Don't even try to convince <laughs> me otherwise. I don't know You're yet. too she-she for I don't know Bainbridge. Yet. We got to go. We got to go. We got to check. We got to We gotta check it out. See to what see for Bainbridge? <laughs> move, move, move next door to Ray Ozzy. She, 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 she. I'm she, she. Jeff Jarvis, number of the week. Well, since we were talking about books, I was starting to research something during the um, uh, Justice Department of Justice versus Penguin Random House trial going on, trying to stop the acquisition of Simon and Schuster. There was a thing that, that, that resonated all around literary Twitter about how few books sell. And so NPD Bookscan's Kristen McLean came in and used the numbers and gave this, which I thought maybe you might find interesting. So the total number of titles, new titles last year, 487,000. Wow. So she looked only at the top 10 publishers. All right. So the, do you think these guys are going to make money, right? So out of that, they published 45,000 titles. Got me so far? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Out of 45,000 titles, how many do you think sold more than 100,000? Uh, That's not, 12. I'm not even talking millions. I'm just taking 100,000 as a, as a decent, decent, good, popular sale. Stacy, what'd you say? 4%? 12. Yeah, I was going to say it doesn't well, do. 163.4%. <laughs> 0.4%. So wow. of those who sold between 50,000 and 100,000, about double okay. that. Right? 300,000. But you get down all the way down the bottom, 14.7% of these books, uh, 6,700 of them, sold fewer than 12 copies. 
Oh, that's so depressing. Oh, that was the 12th. Okay, yeah. That was the 12th. Uh, well, so- 51%, half of them sold between 12, 000, 12 copies and 1,000 copies. You're going to sell 12 to the author and the author's mother. Yeah, exactly. Alone. Yeah. Yep. yeah. They actually get free copies. If you write a book in 12, you can't sell 12 copies to your friends and family. That's so depressing. I know, isn't that? I would cry. Isn't that? I mean, I feel like if I published a book, I could probably get 100 people to buy it, max. I can't. <laughs> you don't, I buy your book, aunt. aunt. You have. My mom wouldn't even buy it. She'd be like, boy, move. <laughs> My best selling, best, best selling book was, I think, 55,000 copies. Which is nice. which is good. That's the second second nice. year there. Well, with having um, a TV show behind it, you know, it's exactly. still pretty. It yeah. was it was a Pearson was very happy, but I, it was like uh, so. There's no money in this, is what you're saying? They're saying yeah. <laughs> so Will Page, who was the former uh, chief economist at Spotify, also in part of this discussion, uh, for context, said that out of the 6.3 million artists on Spotify, just let that sink in. 6.3 million singer songwriters in the world. Everybody wants to give you their song. 78% of them have a monthly audience of fewer than 50. Mm. Yeah, wow. I believe it. Yep. So if the I can throw oh, a, a shout out to my favorite singer songwriter, yeah? Slade Cleaves. Oh, okay. He's amazing. The good news is if you put poo poo in the title, you get you, you make millions because <laughs> two year olds love to shout. Echo, play poo poo. Note to I'm, self. I am to not kidding. Show this is. <laughs> <laughs> they, it's, I'm not. Anybody's got a toddler in the house knows they love doing that, and they'll do it over and over and over again. They do. They like so, farts too. Yep. Speaking of disinformation, poo poo and farts, I should talk about disinformation online and give a plug to our friend Joan Donovan's book. Meme Wars is out right now. Ooh. Should have had poo poo in the title. So now he available on Spotify Plus, The Poop Song by the Toilet Bowl Cleaners, Poop Song and Lyrics by Donald Glover, <laughs> Never Gonna Poop on the Floor by... And if you, if you play any of these, we'll get taken off YouTube. <laughs> How about You Thought We Ran we Out of... deserve it. You Thought We Ran Out of Poop... <laughs> you Thought We Ran Out of Poop Song Ideas, You Were Wrong by the Toilet Bowl Cleaners, <laughs> Poop Clouds. This Toilet Bowl Cleaners actually have a whole album of album? this yeah randy wow. licky poops 11 times a day poop sneeze bristol stool chart i want stomach flu because i love to poo you can stop now you can stop tell me if please, i'm a booger on my nose stop. <laughs> stop, stop. <laughs> and of course oh, no. <laughs> the magnum opus i didn't pee on my tie uh huge these guys make a lot of money i'm just saying yeah. Mr. Anthony Pruitt, <laughs> your pick of the week. My pick uh, is InShot for your iOS or Android devices. Yes. A, uh, editing editing the, uh, app for photos and video. I've been playing with it in contrast to using Premiere Rush on my mobile device. And it's, it's pretty daggum slick. It's got nice transitions, really easy to use. Um, and it... And it the, Video quality comes out 30 frames per second like it should. So, and I like free. it. You can do stills and movies video. Yeah. That's so, nice. Yeah. Free app. There's, it's free, there's free? some ads in it. Yeah, oh, there's some ads. Good. And, you know, if you want to, if you're in a session and you want to stop the ads from popping up, you just have to watch a long one, similar to how we talked about at the beginning of the show with Hulu. And uh, then you can just continue doing what you need to do without any ad interruptions. So, can you yes, pay? Can you that. pay to get rid of the ads, or is that not? I don't think so. I don't remember seeing that option. Yeah. Nice. In it's shot. Nice though. You know, because I've been using Premiere Rush, and Premiere Rush gets on my nerves some days. Um, they could do a lot better with it, Adobe, and hopefully with our very own all about Android Miss Went to It Dow being there at Adobe, maybe that's something that's going to change. Oh, um, she got a job at Adobe, did she? Yeah, she's at Adobe now. Nice, good for her. She's that's... we've chatted. I'll just say that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And my last pick, uh, this is uh, from M. I don't know. I can't think of the name, but someone sent this to me on Twitter, and I thought it was pretty daggum cool. And it's uh, Mike Parkinick. 
Pokernick. <laughs> Sorry if I mispronouncing your last name, but it's AI portraits. Imagine how celebrities would look if they were still alive today. Um, he a, has a Instagram. Uh, this is, uh, he uses AI to do this. Here's Princess Diana. If she were still alive today, I think these are, what I want to do it. is do one for me. That's, um, I didn't like that one because I, th I think it got that one wrong. This is who? Who's this? It's Michael, Michael Jackson. Jackson. Oh, MJ. Oh, my. Oh. Okay. Because that's Michael Jackson from the 70s. Paul. Michael Jackson from the exactly. 90s. Didn't exactly. Look like that. There's uh, yeah. Amy Winehouse. You know, she wouldn't be that old now. Here's the Beatles. So actually, Sir Paul and Ringo, that's what they look like. But this is what John Lennon would look like now, what uh, George Harrison well, would that, look like now. I, it's really good. I mean, it's it a guess. Heath Ledger. Yeah. Yeah. Heath Ledger, uh, as if, as if he didn't have the. <laughs> this is Freddie Mercury <laughs> wearing suspenders, <laughs> look a little like Tom Selleck, but I guess he would, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. My favorite one is that one, Tupac. Tupac. Because um, oh. a lot of the rappers from the '90s and early 2000s, I've seen them <laughs> today, and most of them have aged pretty much about like how that image looks interesting uh he's turkish so some of these are uh, here's turkish that's john lennon um who is this madonna well i don't think we have to guess she's already in her she's 60s <laughs> uh and then right. she doesn't look like that he has some other ai artwork too which is beautiful so this is mid journey so he does some uh, does some interesting stuff those ducks are yeah, real. Pretty good stuff, man. They're not AI. Yeah, I did a mid journey the other day of um I think I said like Milky Way at night in Napa Valley. Just it was something really simple like that. And it came out quite nicely and a lot of people enjoyed it. And I had to be very clear, this is not my photograph. This is AI. Right. Um and I I think that's a problem that we could probably run into in the future with people using these tools to create the art and taking all the credit for it. Um, and I don't know if that's necessarily right. Well, just make sure you didn't get the Getty images uh, watermark off of it before, yeah. <laughs> before you try to pass it off. Trust me, I've yours. severed my relationship with Getty. <laughs> Getty don't pay enough money. Was, mm, yeah. And Pro at Hands-On Photography. What's coming up on Hop? Uh, this week. What is the show this week? I you said something. I thought it sounded really good <laughs> yesterday <laughs> in our editorial meeting, oh, but I don't remember the, either. Um, oh, I want to talk about the iPhone, the new iPhone. Oh, that's right. It. Using the iPhone camera. Yeah. Everybody's pretty excited about that camera. So I figure I will do an episode and share my two cents on it. Nice. You can't borrow mine though. No, don't worry. I'm not. <laughs> I need it. I got to take pictures of Roger Waters. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Jammer B was talking about the concert that he yeah. went to Tuesday. Friday. He went to, he's been, he's been to like a dozen of them, but we're all yeah. going on uh, Friday. Micah's going. Jason uh, Howell's going, right? We're all going. It's going to be exciting. Aunt, Benito. You're, you could come. Benito. It's football. Benito. It's football. football. Oh, football college. Football season. High, high school football. High school college. and college. And yeah. college. Oh, you can't football do that. Football season. No. We've got to have our priorities here. Hey, of course. <laughs> Jeff Jarvis is the director of the Town Night Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at the Craig Newmark, Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. New York. Hey, Jeff. Next time, take your breath so you can say that, sir. I could say it in one breath. <laughs> Ready? The director of the Town Night Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. One breath. Such a Easy. pro. Such a pro. No problem. No problem. Yeah, but I don't think you read the whole card, right? Well, I didn't read this part. <laughs> Google shareholder, former TV guide, critic Frank Sinatra called him a bum. Ray Kroc called him a nickel millionaire. Murphy Brown called him a bottomless bit of hate. Formerly one of San Francisco's most on And Pat bottomless. Sajak hates him. And Pat Sajak hates him, says it right at the bottom. Hated by... Would you hate. write that on? <laughs> we got a new one. <laughs> he keeps it in the dock. <laughs> 
That's great. Uh, Stacey Higginbotham, listen to her podcast, Stacey on IOT. Actually, it's the IOT podcast at StaceyOnIOT.com. At Giga Stacey, go enjoy some waffles. We do this week in Thanks. Google every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. You can watch us do it live at live.twit.tv. If you are watching live, chat live at irc.twit.tv. You can also join us in the Discord chat, which is where the uh, the cool people hang out. Discord, of course, uh, is part of our club Twit. Seven bucks a month gets you ad-free versions of all the shows. In fact, we've got uh, Stacy's Book Club coming up next month. We've decided the Heck, long way got, to a oh, small, yeah, angry planet. Tomorrow. tomorrow, Fireside Chat with Twit members, 9 a.m. Pacific. Ooh, uh, there's lots of stuff going on in there. I've been playing uh, in our Let's Play. I've been playing games online. It is Satisfactory, which is a lot of fun on uh, Saturday. And I think I'm going to do another one uh, maybe tomorrow. The Let's Play group also has access to a Minecraft server, a, jo a group Minecraft server. We talk about games in there. We talk about space. We talk about movies and TV and music and makers and gaming and beer and wine and cocktails and more. Coding, too. And, of course, all the shows. You also get ad-free versions of all of our shows, and you get the Twit Plus feed. That's Club Twit, which is just 7 bucks a month at twit.tv slash Club Twit. The hands-on Mac with Micah and hands-on Windows with Paul Therant. There's a lot of good content in there. Yeah. A lot of stuff for your 7 bucks. Plus, you get to hang with Ant. <laughs> You can also get on-demand of shows, uh, versions of the shows for free, ad-supported, at our website, twit.tv slash twig. You can get them on YouTube. There's a YouTube channel dedicated to the show. And, of course, the easiest thing to do is subscribe in your favorite podcast client. That way you'll get it automatically the minute it's available uh, so you can listen uh, of a Thursday morning. Next week on the show, ooh, this is going to be fun, Douglas Rushkoff, who is a professor of media theory at CUNY in Queens, your colleague, I know you did a class with him, Jeff, mm -hmm. uh, named one of the world's 10 most influential influential intellectuals by MIT. Whoa. He, nice, huh? Now that I know that. Yeah. Jeez. His new book just coming out, Survival of the Richest, Escape Fantasies of the Tech Billionaires. He says the tech billionaires are under the influence of the mindset a Silicon Valley-style certainty that they can break the laws of physics, economics, and morality to escape a disaster of their own making as long as they have enough money and the right technology. This is a, he, this is a great book. So much fun. I can't wait to read it uh, and interview him on next Wednesday on Twig. So we'll miss you, Stacy. but... Yeah, last week, Stacey, but you'll have someone away. better. You missed Matt Mullenweg. <laughs> Matt Mullenweg. And now you missed Word Douglas Rush. Yeah. Like Matt. Yeah. Yeah. Matt's so sweet. Mario. Oh, he was, oh, was great. great. Just great. Well, when you're not here, we feel like we have to really stretch to fill. That's shoes, right. So we, yeah, my, we're stretching. My giant we're getting shoes. the stars. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week on This Week in Google. Bye bye. Don't miss All About Android every week. We talk about the latest news, hardware, apps, and now all the developer -y goodness happening in the Android ecosystem. I'm Jason Howell, also joined by Ron Richards, Florence Ion, and our newest co-host on the panel, Wen Tu Dao, who brings her developer chops. Really great stuff. We also invite people from all over the Android ecosystem to talk about this mobile platform we love so much. Join us every Tuesday, All About Android, on twit.tv.